We are back with another episode of Locked In with Ian Bick. I know you guys love the mob stories, so today I have Chicky Chickatelli here with me to talk about his time being a bookie for the Genovese crime family. In this episode, we hear about his upbringing, the time he spent working with the mob, and how he was sentenced to federal prison and then gets out of prison and ends up back on house arrest for a second criminal case. Hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode with Chicky Chickatelli. Also guys, I have really exciting news for you. Factor is our first sponsor for Locked In and is sponsoring this episode today. Huge thanks to them for coming on board. Factor delivers delicious, fresh, never frozen meals that are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes. You could support our show by heading to factormeals.com slash locked in 50 and use code locked in 50 to get 50% off your order. Also, guys, before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to just take one second to touch on one quick thing. I was reading the reviews from the survey a lot of you guys have taken to support our podcast, and one of them really stuck out, and I just wanted to share it with you guys. One of our watchers said, Locked In is about redemption, broken humans healing, learning, and doing better, and in the process, other humans are helped. I think that nails what our show is about right on the head. And I just wanted to appreciate you guys who take the time to leave us comments, reviews, everything like that. This has been a great learning experience and the show has really, really, really progressed in just a few short months. And if you guys could continue to do us a favor and go on to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from and just you know leave us a review, it helps boost the show and gets it out there to more people. All right, guys, that's all I got for you. Enjoy this crazy interview with Chicky Chickatelli. Chicky Chickatelli, man, welcome to Locked In. You came all the way out here from Springfield. Really appreciate you making the drive. I've been looking forward to this interview since we talked like two weeks ago, and I think the viewers are going to love it. I think this conversation is going to be great. It's definitely like the first one of its kind we've had on the show. Before we get started, I have to ask, how, is, is Chicky your real name? And, and how the hell did you get the name Chicky? Since I was a kid, you know, Chicky, everybody knows me by Chicky. My first name, born name is David, David John Chickatelli, but Chicky might as well be on my birth certificate at this point. It suits you. I love the name Chicky because <laughs> it's not like what you expect. Like when I first talked to you, like right. Chicky fit your personality, right? But it doesn't really like fit the person, right? Uh, but no, I love it. So <laughs> I'm not thank calling you. you David. I'm calling you, you Chicky. I got you, and thank you for having me. It was a, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Of course, man. Uh, starting at the beginning of your story, where are you from? Where did you grow up? What's your childhood like? I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. It's uh, Western Mass, west of Boston, right on the Connecticut River. Um, Hartford's. 35 minutes for me, New Haven's maybe an hour and a half, New York, the city's about two hours and 15 minutes. We're centrally, Providence is an hour, Boston's an hour, so we're centrally pretty much around everything, really. And you grew up lower, middle, upper class? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say maybe middle class or maybe a little lower than middle class. Uh, my father worked his whole life uh, as a, a shop foreman at a chain belt company uh, in my area. And my mother, 45 years, was a crossing guard for the kids. You know, she 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 had kids that she crossed, and their fathers and mothers she crossed, and even their grandkids at the end. And uh, 45 years, she was uh, doing this this crosswalking. You know, the guard. That's awesome. So that yeah. was like her full time job. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. I've always I've always been curious, like if people do that full time or if it's like a part time gig right. or how that works. Well, my father worked full time, obviously. So you know, she did it just to kind of get out of the house and uh, three times a day in the morning, then 12 o'clock kids, I get out and then three o'clock. She did it 45 years. So she must've liked it, you know, and they <laughs> loved her. They called her Mrs. Chick. Even the, my father was Mr. Chick. So Mr. Chick. Yeah. That's it. He was a baseball coach, a big baseball coach in our, in our area, all the kids. I mean, he would pick up the kids, you know, in his old Ford LTD, you know, probably 10 kids. And back in the day, it was funny now looking back, but he used to smoke cigarettes. He was a chain smoker, uh, you know, when he was when we were younger, and uh, nobody knew about all oh, that's dangerous. So we'd drive ten of us, and the whole car would be like uh, smoke, and you know, we didn't even think nothing of it. But you know, it was a different mentality back then. Now, did you have siblings at all? Yeah, I have a I have a sister, 
and I have two brothers. And uh, the youngest brother up from me, they're all older than me, is uh, essentially 11 years older. So uh, my mother laughs. Uh, she passed, uh, God rest her soul, my father too, but she used to laugh at me. And she said, we sold all the child stuff. And I went to the doctor because I thought I had the flu, but it was a live flu, she used to say. So I essentially grew up, you know, my, my siblings were out of the house when I was growing up as far as 10, 12, 15. They were already gone, married and had their own family. So I pretty much grew up uh, myself, my mother and father, and my mother's mother, my grandmother lived in the house with us. So when my parents got home from their honeymoon, she was there, you know. So I essentially had two mothers and my father and me. And uh, my grandmother, she was the cook, the head cook of the house. Uh, my father would get out of work, he'd be hungry, and he'd go there and start picking, you know, how they do it. And she would, you know, start swearing, get out of here. And so it was funny, a lot of laughs, a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was a good, very good childhood, you know. Uh, not like today with the cell phones and the computers and you sit in your room, you know, you'd be out in the morning, eight o'clock, and, you know, you'd have to be home when the lights came on, whatever time that may be. Yeah. So it was a great, great time to grow up, you know. Do you wish you had, like, siblings that were closer in age? Like, I know for me, I've always, like, wanted a sister to, to see what that was like. I have a brother, but I've always, like, wanted a sister. Right. Did you feel like... A loner in that sense? No, or? not really. I mean, I played sports. I mean, I wasn't the best at it, but I, I played sports. And it doesn't it doesn't hurt when your father's the coach. You know what <laughs> I mean? But anyways, uh, you know, I had a lot of fun as a kid. I never thought of it that way as far as, uh, you know, oh, I wish they were younger. Just, yeah, it, it was what it was, you know. Now ethnicity, fully Italian? 100%. No, no, no. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, pretty much Italian, but my mother has a little French in her, you okay. know? Yeah. Yeah, my mom's side of the family is Italian, so I knew what right. you meant by like with the grandmother doing the cooking and right. the big oh, meals and right. the picking. They get mad when you go in the kitchen and, and all that. Right. My father, actually, my my father has seven brothers and four sisters, and they grew up uh, on Arthur Avenue in a five-story walk-up. So like for whatever, a two-bedroom, that's a lot of kids. And uh, so they're from the Bronx. And my father came over with... Uh, I think two brothers stayed there and the other five and my father, whatever it was, came to Western Mass, New England area to uh, their, their thing was the auto body business. And I guess at the time from what my father tells me in the Bronx and then surrounding New York areas, uh, there was a lot of auto bodies. So they picked up, you know, and my four aunts came and uh, they came to Western Massachusetts area and they opened probably at one time, we had six auto bodies every brother owned their own auto body. And to this day, three of them are still open. So, right. but my father wasn't into the auto body business. I mean, his brothers and everything. My father was in the Marines. So he went off to the Marines and, um, and then he came home and he went into manufacturing. And uh, so to this day, I got a lot of cousins. We got a ton of cousins and they're all into the auto body business. That was their their thing. Now, when you were growing up, was your father connected to the mob at no, all? No, no. So none, none, none in your family? He knew a lot of them. He respected them. But it, I want to say, if you want to compare it to something, it was almost like uh, in Bronx Tale, the part, the part that uh, Robert De Niro plays, mm -hmm. where it's like, I respect them. I know who they are, but that's not me. My father was a hard worker, and that's all he wanted to do. You know, he, he was, it was old school. He'd come home on Thursday, give my mother the check, and, you know, they go do their billing, but my mother paid all the bills. You know, my father would just, whatever allowance, you know, it was, it was all about family, all old school. You know, my father was in bed eight o'clock at night and, you know, it just was a very normal home. You know, I grew up in a very normal, uh, pretty tough area of, of Springfield. It was called Hungry Hill East Springfield. Was right, I was right on the line, tough Irish kids, and then a mixture of Italian and so on where I was. So I grew up playing sports with the Irish kids, with everybody, you know. But uh, yeah, it was it was a great, great childhood. It really was. I was blessed as far as that. that now, what what time period is this? Just to put it in perspective. Uh, probably all through like mid seventies on, and uh, I graduated high school in nineteen eighty five. So and then uh, you know, so all in probably from like you know seventies mid seventies on, and uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it was great. I made a lot of friends and was into the sports, hockey, baseball, soccer. And uh, 
it was a great childhood. You know, I I have no bad memories of a, of childhood. You know, that's great. Yeah, I think it's gonna be interesting as we carry on throughout this conversation to find out how you get in to the life you become not coming from your dad. Because a lot right. of a, a lot of the people I talked to, it stemmed, you know, from a family right. member when they go into these types of things. Right. So that'll be interesting. But yeah. focusing on like middle school and high school, I know you said that was great. Were yep. you in, like hanging around a rough crowd at all? Yeah, there was rough kids. I mean, I, you know, we had a, like I said, it was a mixture of Italians and Irish I hang around with. So you got the craziness of both. But uh, it was mostly sports. And uh, when I graduated high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I joined the United States Navy. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I went to boot camp uh, uh, February of uh, 1986, Great Lakes, Illinois, uh, Navy boot camp. And I did very well in boot camp uh, as far as like the A school and the schooling after the thing, after the um, boot camp. And uh, I remember, just funny story, the uh, top three guys in our class, the highest scores, got to pick of one of three duty stations. And they would, you would guarantee at least one of them three. So, you know, as a, just a fluke, I put in, you know, I'm from, it's winter, it's freezing, you know, below zero in Chicago. So I just put as a fluke, Honolulu. And I actually get Pearl Harbor. Really? USS Cimarron. Yeah, it was a, a, a attack oiler. Uh, it's decommissioned now, but so, you know, after A school, I did very well. I got my duty station. I mean, I came home for, they let you come home for about a month because they consider it going overseas, even though you're not, you're in the United States. And, uh, you know, Honolulu is considered part of the United States. And uh, I had to meet my ship in Guam. So here's a, you know, I'm on a, it's just like, a, and I really didn't go nowhere pretty much before that. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's how, it, you know, and I remember it was funny. I had a, you know, girlfriend at that age. We were 17, 18. And, uh, you know, once they hear you're going four years to Honolulu, that didn't last too long, you know, yeah, after I mean, they, you know. But they all love the, like the military guys. So yeah. you meet girls out there oh, and you do all that. It's crazy. Now, it's absolutely crazy. High school, are you getting arrested at all? Are you getting into trouble? No, like, you know, during high school, a couple of fights and, you know, you get picked up, you $50 bail, nothing bad that came after. And um, no, just, you know, ball, ball. I was always known to be a ball buster. I was a very, uh, made people laugh, you know, I was a jokester, you know, I loved doing practical jokes and uh, which, you know, like I said, just crazy things like, uh, just one example, um, we used to go down to the South End, which is the, the Italian section of Springfield, all the social clubs and restaurants, Italians, you know, we knew all the guys and, uh, and I'll get into that after how I knew them, but, and we would have, back then they had the um, one cable box and the clicker, but it worked, the, the clicker, worked on every house. You know, all you had to do was go up to the window and press it and it would change the TV. So we go down to the Italian club and we look through the cellar windows and all the guys would be horse racing or football, be a lot of money bet on them games. And we'd wait till like a bomb was thrown. Just, I'm just giving you a little- <laughs> No, no, I crazy, love it, yeah. yeah, the crazy stories we used to do. Yeah. And they would chase us, but we'd go downstairs and they, for a few times we'd laugh because they didn't know what was happening. But we wait for like a bomb to get thrown and everybody's up at the TV screaming, the Italian guys, and we'd shut the TV off. And mm -hmm. if we had a cell phone back then, the reaction was, you would be crying. These guys would be throwing stuff, cursing the TV. And then the same thing again, you know, next time if there was a boxing match and they're fighting it out, we'd switch to like a kid's channel. And the reaction was incredible. So Yeah, because now you can do it now on the app with the phone and you yeah, can just yeah, sync yeah, it in. I'd right. mess with it. Like when my cousins are over, I'll flick it off with the app but we'll right, be in right. the middle of something. Yeah. And then they uh, at the Danbury Mall, they opened up a prank store when we were in high school. Right. So we would go and buy the stink bombs and the ones that you shake and yeah. throw. So we'd yeah. put those all over the high mm -hmm. school and middle school. It was absolutely great. Yeah, so I mean, as kids, we were crazy as far as that, <laughs> the things we used to do. But looking back now, I'm like, oh my God. But small, it started off small, like just busting chops and, you know, so that's how it started. Were you a bully at all or? or no, you... no, I was never like that. Um, my friends, the ones we hung around were never like that. We were like, want to call it anti-bull. Like there'd be guys that would bully people. And even back in junior high, we'd go up and say, hey, buddy, we, you know, pull them a little side and say, what are you doing? You know, and, you know, there was bullies. I mean, now it's crazy what's going on, but uh 
Yeah, so we would be kind of want to say anti bull, you know, something like that, you know. Yeah, like you were the cool kids, but you weren't like the popular ones. You guys are like in your own circle. Yeah, in, in our world. own circle. Like a lot of athletes, like guys that went on to play for professional hockey, were around me. You know, in our air, area, they went on and they became really good athletes. And you know, we were around them kind of guys. You know, yeah. um, now, good kids. This area in Springfield, are you guys seeing like violence growing up at all? From like what's going on with the mob or anything oh, like that. I mean, not just them. I mean, the back. I mean, the gangs. Forget about it. But um, that was in the eighties. Now in two thousand twenty-three, it's a whole nother level. You know. I mean, in Massachusetts, Springfield's the top five of the most violent. I mean, there's Springfield, and then right up two miles away from us is Holyoke. They're in the top five of the most violent. Even Boston, even in the top five. So. Yeah, we had a lot of lot of craziness. What uh, do you think was something that like you saw that or heard about during when you were growing up that really stuck with you? Well, I mean, I don't know if it stuck with me, but it definitely. Uh, I we seen a lot of things, you know what I mean? Uh, murders and this and that. Not me actually seeing it, but you know, it was a it was a lot of gangs back in you know in the eighties, a lot of gangs. Excuse me. And uh, you know, you just see this stuff, and it it's like you know it didn't like stick with you or it affects you, but. You're like, wow. And I mean, now it's a whole nother level, you know? Do you think it like put like a thought in your mind that would like develop later on when you actually joined uh, and, and being a part of like these types of activities at all? Uh, I mean, not really. I mean, you, you just thought it was normal. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I mean, even to this day, even back then, I don't know if it was something wrong with me, but I used to root for the bank robber to get away. You know what I mean? Like if you see something on the news and the cops are chasing them, you're like, come on, take a left. And in your head, you're thinking this way. And, uh, it was crazy. Even as a young kid, I can remember 14, 15, 16. Um, and it was just crazy because you see some kids, they have like uh, posters on their wall at the time of say new kids on the block or Madonna or some sports figure. And you'd go in my room and it was the funniest thing because I had a whole wall with like gangsters and John Gotti Sr. And you know, it just was crazy. That was our mindset, though. You know what I mean? I didn't want my father's like say, "Hey, you want a poster of uh, whoever at the time base brought Red Sox?" And I say, "No, nah, I'm all set." And then, and it was funny because my mother was totally against it. She'd come in to clean my room, and she'd see the posters, and I'd catch her once in a while, and she'd give the all, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, I can go on to after where that led to, but as I got older, and uh, you know, 16, 17, 18. My friends and I would go to bars in Springfield, and they were owned by wise guys. A lot of these bars were owned, and we never got carded. You know, you're supposed to drink when you're 21, but once we started hanging around, they knew, oh, you know, these guys are good guys, blah, 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 whatever. And the, so the bouncers, we didn't even wait. You know, I mean, it's just the way it was. We walked right in line, but we uh, would always get in trouble for bar fights and disrupting their business. And uh, I can remember getting several times I got pinched with my friends uh, who later on in life, I mean, came up to be like bosses in that, in the organized crime. So we were hanging around since little kids and uh, we get arrested, excuse me, we get arrested and uh, we'd make bail after a day or overnight and I'd come back to my room, you know, and all the posters would be ripped down. Like that was my mother's chance to say, it's gonna, you know, your mind's, you know, whatever she would say, she'd rip all the posters down. And then a week later, I have them back up again, you know, but it was funny. It was, it was, it was, it was funny. And then later on in life, it was a little bit crazy because my mother started getting used to it because between me and a family member who was in trouble all the time, the cops or organized crime task force would come to our house later on, you know, in my twenties. And my mother at that point would just sit in the front porch and say, you know, who are you here for? Chicky or, or my, or my relative. Oh, wow. So it was, you know, it just became crazy. You so know? As a teenager during that time period, what's you and your friends view on like the mob and organized crime? Oh, it was like, it, like people that look up to, uh, you know, whatever the uh, Le LeBron James, that's how we looked up to them guys. I mean, I'm just being real, you know, uh, cause you, that's it. You know, you think that's, this is it. Oh my God. Did you, oh, did you see this, the, the alligator skin shoes this guy had on? Oh, this, that, whatever it was. Oh, she has car. You know, you're thinking different. You know what I mean? It's like we looked up to it. I ain't gonna lie to you. Like, like somebody will look, uh, somebody will look to go to college and be a great athlete in college or win the Heisman. Just say, 
we looked like, oh my God, if I could ever make it to that level, you know, it just was a whole complete- You, you looked up to these guys. 100%, yeah. 100%, yeah. And you think that would definitely influence you later on in life? Oh yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, I was around one in particular guy who, you know, uh, according to, you know, the news, not me, I'm not saying nothing, it's just what they said about him, but he ends up becoming a boss and, uh, actually got murdered at our social club after a Sunday night card game. And the guy's name was Adolfo Big Al Bruno. And uh, he was around us, me in particular, more than the other guys. I mean, I knew him and I respected him and they liked me, but this was the, this particular guy was my guy. You know what I mean? I end up, you know, later on in life, you know, running his sports operation for gambling and stuff. And that's what I was convicted and was sent to prison for. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, you look up to these guys and uh, it's just the way it was. I mean, it was just a crazy, crazy time. Yeah, so for the most part, you know, normal family, hardworking parents. Absolutely. Grew up, nothing major. You got into what kids get into. Yeah. You go to the Navy. Yep. So where does it, what, what, where does it change? You know, how does someone that grows up like that goes off the wagon into something different? Well, what happened was I ended up getting out of the Navy, okay, and I was retired because I got hurt in the Navy. Uh, uh, an accident in the Navy, I got hurt. So they retired me. So I come home and like, I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, odd jobs here and there. And uh, me and two friends of mine, uh, close friends, my childhood friends, uh, the guy I was mentioned, Adolfo Al Bruno, good what, guy. What a name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was a good guy. Uh, and uh, he presented us, uh, pr excuse me, presented us with a million dollar business. He owned a piece of property with a bar, wine, beer, wine, a whole restaurant on a lake where a ton of people came. And if we did it right, we could have been multimillionaires, but we were 21, 22. We didn't want to work, to be honest with you. We used it as a party place and he owned the property and the business. So we, he said, go in there. Nobody's in there. You know, pay me this little bow, whatever, give me a piece and do it. And uh, this was like, 1990, 91, the, the clubhouse. We had an outdoor venue with a stage and everything. And um, at the time, it was big with the clubhouse music. Uh, Lizette Melendez, Johnny O, remember them? Ah, right? that's, yeah, I okay, wasn't even well, born sorry, yet. <laughs> but it was big, it was a, it was a free, freestyle, they call it clubhouse. Yeah. So we would get these people from New York to come. A lot of them were in New York, most of all of them. And they would come down to do a show at our place. And the whole beach would be packed and there'd be girls and the, you know, beer and wine selling out food. We had a great opportunity. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, it only lasted a year because uh, every weekend the cops would be pulling in and you know, there'd be fights, which probably 95% of the time we would create our own fights with you know, somebody didn't want to pay or wise guy. So we had a great opportunity. I mean, uh, we were too young though to appreciate it. You but know? Chicky, why is this guy giving a bunch of 20, 21 year olds at this club? That's like that. He believed in us back then. Really? Well, we wore that out quick, but but no, he believed in us and he said, you guys can make some money, you know, make a good money and it's legit. So he was trying to put you guys on. Was, yeah, he was putting us on in the right direction as far as making money and, uh, and then all the sports and everything. I mean, as kids, we were betting games. I had one friend, his God is my judge, and he's a big time a guy out there, he got out of that life. He ended up cooperating and got out of that life, but uh, he was my childhood friend. And he does podcasts, he, the guy, his name is uh, Anthony Arolata. And uh, he was betting games at 15 years old. They knew his voice on the phone. So he would call me and say, can you call, use your voice and bet like, he'd give me like 15 games at a thousand a game, one night or one weekend, 15 year old kid. And this, was, and, and this guy's honest truth, this is the kind of, uh, kid he was. He was a bad gambler. And, you know, he paid sometimes and sometimes he didn't. But so we were around guys that were like that, loved gambling and stuff like that. So since from, from like even my 15, 14, we were betting games that, you know, I wasn't, but, you know, I was doing it for him. But, and that got us in a lot of trouble later on in life, you know? Do you think if it, that business had worked out, your life would be so much different now? How many, how many businesses is 19, 20, 21 year old kids are involved in. And you're thinking if I only could go back the age I am now, I'd be a lot smarter, I'd take it serious. 
I think so, about that all the time. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that's an open question. You could think of that. I mean, there's probably some of your people listening that probably said, oh my God, if I would ever stuck with that. But I, at that age, you know, we're, you know, it was just about let's have fun, you know. And it, you I know. know, I know we're not supposed to dwell on the past, but I like, I always find myself thinking about the what ifs, like what if that business worked out? What if that relationship worked out? Like sometimes you, you think, think about, about it. Yeah, yeah, you do, but you can't, you, when that goes off in your head to say that, you got to kind of just snap out of it because hmm. shoulda, coulda, woulda, we I, didn't. I use it as a motivator, I think. hundred percent. You, you use that. It's like, okay, it didn't work. I don't dwell on it to where it's like, I'm like sad over it. I'm just like, what if? And then I use that to base my next future. decisions, future decisions I off got of. You. No, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. So I, one quick comment. You know who you remind me of while I'm looking at you who? and you're talking about this story? Who? John Goodman from The Gambler. Oh, with yeah, Mark yeah, Wahlberg, yeah, yeah, where yeah. he's telling Thank him, because that's been popping up in my TikTok lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one scene where he's like, you know, you got to have the fuck you money. You got to do this. You got to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking to Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> yeah, about yeah. that. That was a uh, great movie. Yeah, that was funny. I, I know what you're talking about. So how do you go, like, what's next after this business fails? How do you start evolving into like a bookie and, and well, getting into that? During the time, and this is all public knowledge, it's like, like I'm giving secrets away, but um, after, during the time when I, we had the, the little restaurant bar venue, um, in my area, uh, Bruno, Adolfo Bruno's guys, he had a lot of older guys in the office, they all took pinches. Some had to go to jail, some, you know, obviously you can't do that no more, they're watching you, they're on probation. So uh, it was funny, it's a funny story because I knew what it was, but I didn't know a lot of the terminology and... Uh, I can remember one of my dear friend's father coming up to me and he said, hey, Chicky, we need a guy in the office. He trusts you. He likes you. Do you want to do it? Do you want to clean out the office? That's what he said. So now right away, I knew what taking bets was, but then I didn't know what clean out the office means. What that means is you stay on top of the other bookmakers where they can't pass post you. They can't, after a game is already won, they say, oh, somebody called it in and you stay on top of it. We used to do it through faxes and going to the house and picking up the paperwork, right? Like if the game started at one o'clock, by 10 after one, you went and got the stuff or at least faxed it to you where you're staying on top of it. So I can remember, it was funny now looking back, but I can remember as a kid saying, I ain't cleaning out the office where I got to sweep and do, to I ain't doing that. And the guy starts laughing. He goes, that ain't what I mean. And you know, then it took a couple of minutes, but I knew what he meant. But, uh, but that's our thinking. I'm not clean. Imagine I'm not cleaning out the office. I got to sweep. I'll go do a regular job, you know? But it wasn't that, like I explained. But uh, yeah, so it started off, uh, I had known Bruno and I known a lot of the guys because uh, as a kid, 10, 11, 9, I used to work in uh, my friend's father owned a huge fruit stand, big fruit stand in Springfield. So I worked there on the weekends, you know, for a kid making money and uh, they would all come in and they would use it as, uh, they'd buy their Sunday, most Sunday morning, their vegetables and fruit, whatever. And then they would always use it they had a, he had a back room that he used to store pasta and wine grapes and different things. And they would go meet up there. And we would always be inquisitive. Oh, who's that guy? Oh, they pulled in with New York plates. Oh, that guy's from Rhode Island. You know, and we would be, you know, hiding, looking. So we ended up meeting them, um, a lot of them. I did through that experience. Now, what family are they a part of? Well, allegedly, but, you know, it's like I said, it's, uh, it's uh, what makes Springfield unique and some parts of Connecticut is allegedly they're part of the Genovese crime family. And who is the Genovese crime family? It's one of the five families in New York. Uh, they call it the Ivy League. Very, very big family. Uh, very powerful. You know, um, I mean, back then anyways, I, you know, now, I mean, come on, they got a, um, they got a, a camera on every street corner. Everybody got cameras now, you know, so I don't know how it is now, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. But like I said, uh, that's what, you know, that's what makes it because Boston has their own thing, uh, you know, part of the patriarchal crime family out of Providence, Rhode Island. And they got Providence, which is tied in with them. And, um, and then in Boston, you had the Irish guys, Whitey Bulger and them guys, they were mixed. And uh, that was another whole story that was tied in with our area. But anyways, um, so yeah, so they got the families and you know, the, they were, Boston is uh, pretty much the patriarchal crime family. So Springfield... It's only maybe an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and five minutes from, like I said, from Boston, right on the Connecticut River. We're actually close to Hartford. And uh, yeah, so they were, you know, for since probably 1930, they had a wing, uh, allegedly, <laughs> had a wing in our area 
of uh, the Genovese. What are you? What are your thoughts on them at that time? Are you afraid of them? Are you excited to be working allegedly? Like, oh, what do you I do? Mean, what do you? It'd be like. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Do you feel like you just got drafted to yeah, like a yeah, movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna come, remember the movie Rudy. What was the yeah, guy's name? Uh, uh, whatever the guy that I played did. for Penn State. What, it was yeah. like in our head. That's how it was. Like you know what I mean? It just it was a crazy way of thinking, you know. But as kids, like I said, it was like I got drafted to a Division One college in my head. It but, just happens to be the Genovese drive. Well, whatever, yeah, alleged, yeah. That's uh, that's pretty crazy when you put it yeah. in perspective mm -hmm. like that. But that was normal for you. Yeah. Now, is your like, what's your communication like with your parents? Are they like, you're a fucking idiot? What are no, you doing? No, like, they were. They, I mean, they'd say once in a while, be careful. But it was never like you. What are you, an effing idiot? Nothing like that. So they didn't sit down. No, and, okay, yeah. but I mean, it was around. They knew my father knew the guys. My father go to the touch football games and the guys who were involved, sons would play or nephews would play. And my father would chop it up with them. They laugh and talk. And uh, so it was normal. Do you it think was, it disappointed him? No, no. I, I mean, it disappointed him when I would get locked up and there would be bail and I'd be on the news. And then uh, I remember one time, it was funny, we had a big reporter, organized crime reporter in, in, in our area and uh, She's been doing it for 20 years. She knew everything about everything. And, uh, you know, they want to come up with these uh, these names. They call you. They make up a name for you. And I'll never forget it. It was uh, uh, 2005, and we got picked up by the feds. It was an F FBI case. And the uh, headlines was Fat Chicky, Chickatelli for running a multi-million dollar illegal sports gambling. And instead of, like, it was funny because uh, that the next morning after we got made bail, um, I had went over to a friend's house who was involved in that business. He goes on later, years later, to be the boss. And uh, we get in the, his truck. And back then, it wasn't the social media and all that. So he had the newspaper. And instead of saying, oh, my God, we got arrested. We're in trouble. I wonder what's going to happen. We weren't thinking that. I get in his car to go get coffee, 7 in the morning, and he's laughing hysterical. And I go, what are you laughing at? He go, and I didn't know at this point. And he goes, did you see the front page of the newspaper? I said, no. So he shows it to me, and it's big, there I am, right? It's snowy day, I'm wearing a green and black velour Celtic sweatsuit. You know, they come four in the morning, you can't just say, well, let me get a nice outfit. You know, you know that. Yeah. And uh, he shows me the front page, fat, chicky, chicka, tell, blah, 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 the whole thing. So instead of being like, oh, I'm like that filthy animal, I'm abusing the reporter, saying, you know, you know, for, I don't know why they would call me Fat Chicky. I don't know where they got that from. Yeah. But no, no. But I'm just saying, uh, they make up names, you know? And uh, so she made up that name and it stuck with me to this day. Any article you read it, which, what are you going to do? You yeah. know, <laughs> I laugh. I, it, you got to yeah. laugh at yourself sometimes because if you, you know, you it was know what good I mean. press. No such thing as yeah, bad press. Yeah, no. We used to, we laugh. But we, I was more concerned they called me Fat Chicky than the federal indictment that ends up putting me. In jail, you know, going to federal prison. Yeah, but I so got arrested. But that was our yeah. thing, you know? I was so concerned about the comments and the titles. I was thinking more about that than yeah. anything else. But yeah. I, now, how does it lead up to that? Like, what are you doing? What are the ins and outs? What's well, was, the operation? I was in the office. I mean, I was running the office, big office, very big office. And uh, How old are you? Early 20s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, t uh, 21, 22, roughly. And uh, What's a day in the life? Well, I did it. I did it. Let me just give you a little scenario. I started working in like 1989, 90, right when I got out of the military to 2005. And then after that, uh, um, 2005, I went to prison. And then uh, when I got out, of course, you're on the three-year probation and they're on you and you can't really do much. And, uh, you know, I just started thinking differently. Um, in between that time, 1993, I had my first daughter and 95, I had my second daughter and I was married. So, you know, like I said, you just think, start to, uh, in my head, in back of my head, I'm starting to think, you know, God forbid I p catch a big case and I got to go for 20 years or what, what are these, what are they going to do? I mean, what are, you know, what are my kids going to do? So I kind of, you know, I mean, I was doing small things here and there just to grab a little extra money, but the, the crazy thinking started a little bit, uh, you know, slacking off a little bit. You know, you're thinking different now, your kid. Now you start thinking, you're not thinking, of, I'm not thinking of me no more, I'm thinking of them. And and that's, you know what I mean? But you so, still kept doing what you were doing. Yeah, a little bit, but I thought I was, everybody thinks they're smarter because they're thinking like, well, this and that, oh, well, if I, if I, 
go down six streets and back up and go another way, you're going to throw off a person following you. But in your head, you make, you feel, you make yourself feel good thinking that, but if they want you, they got you they're going to get you. you Are know? you making a lot of money as a yeah, bookie? Yeah, a lot of money. And it's all cash? Yeah, it's all cash. I mean, uh, I think uh, when I got pinched, they, they, they well, it was overall $3 million, but uh, in, a, in a couple year time, but they estimated like 300000 a month. Now, you're not like working for yourself. You're working for these guys and you're- and, One in particular guy. And they're paying you a salary to do this? Salary. And then of course, you know, if they had a good week, you're getting a commission, you know, whatever. Now, are you involved in the violence aspect of that? No, I mean, that's one thing about me and you can, you know, anybody will tell you. I wasn't the guy, oh, let's go break somebody's head. But I wasn't the guy, you know, that would say, I'm only a sports guy. I don't do that. There's been a lot of times that they would call and say, listen, we got three guys. We need two more. All right, let's go. Not crazy, but a beating or whatever. You know, yeah, I did do that, but, uh, you know. Yeah, what happens if someone is in gambling debt with the mob? How, how does it go down? Well, they the, tell you, Chicky, I can't in, pay this. Well, in my own, uh, you know, in my own, you know, what I saw, we were around a good guy. Like, uh, listen, the violence thing, I mean, people could make up these stories on YouTube, all these crazy stories. I killed 30 people. I killed two people. All this nonsense, which some of them did some of that, but they work it out with you. You know, they're like, hey, you know, what can you pay a week? You're done gambling. Don't do that. And, you know, they're not looking to bust you. You know, they really ain't. Okay. Don't get me wrong. There are some crazy guys out there, you know, that used to do crazy things, but you know, anything with violence, you know, it ain't a joke. You're going to jail. In other words, not even jail for a few years. Violence, that's where you get stuck. That's where you're, you know, the 10, 20, 30 years, you know, that's, that's, that's what happens, you know? Yeah, it's not with worth the violence. it. Yeah, it's not worth it for them to, like, kill someone nah, over 10 grand. Stupid. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. In history, were there crazy people that did that? Yeah, but they ended up in their trunk. I mean, uh, that know, happens, right? Roy DeMeo, uh, you know, I could name crazy guys. They don't last, you know? Yeah, they're feared but they don't last, you know? So I, my guy, you know, he was good like that. You know, whatever you need. He'd even say, you know, if you, oh, well, they'd say, I remember a couple of since, oh, we lost our job. Don't worry about it. Go over to uh, Frigo's, which was a huge plant that sold Frigo meats and stuff. Go Monday, say, I sent you, boom. The guy's got a career, you know, making. So he was very good, my guy. If I had to compare him to somebody in a, in a small aspect, I would compare him to like John Gotti Sr. of our area at one point. You know, that's how he was. Very flashy dresser, gentleman, help people. You know, but he was just a, in my experience, he was a good guy, you know. Were there big names in the mob that you were interacting with or are you just oh, low yeah. on the total? No, I mean, I mean, uh, no, I mean, there were some big names, notorious guys. Uh, one of my friends, uh, he's worldwide, uh, the two brothers were from my area. They were with us all the time, eating dinner, going to their houses. His name is Freddie and Ty G is. And uh, Freddie allegedly, and I hope somehow they, they find out it's not true, but he's accused of killing Whitey Bulger, you know, the notorious Boston gangster. In prison. In prison, yeah, in uh, Hazleton, West Virginia, which, uh, you know, whatever it is, the cameras, they couldn't see. So it might be a setup. You know, they had him in the hole for four, almost five, for almost five years. That's crazy. Yeah, they had him in a hole with no uh, trial, no nothing. They did, you know, and just recently in the last year, they just brought charges on him for uh, murder, him and a, another kid that we know from up in the Boston area. But we grew up with them kids. We used to laugh, go drink and go to dinner, go to our house. I mean, you know, and they were, they were, and they took, both of them took life sentences and stood up. I mean, they could have cooperated and they didn't. And, uh, so, you know, these kids were around us. Uh, another guy uh, ends up becoming the boss, uh, my childhood friend, and then uh, he left, the, he cooperated and left the life. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Bruno was, in the, I mean, they got pictures on uh, the internet of uh, Bruno on a boat in Fort Lauderdale with little Nicky Scarfo from Philly. I mean, so, you know, you're talking about some big people. I was in prison, um, MCC Manhattan with Vinnie Bastiano, Vinnie Gorgeous, who allegedly uh, is, uh, I like that word allegedly, but he That's was- the safest uh, word to use. Yeah, he was supposedly, you know, one, at one time a boss at a, allegedly the Bonato field. Now you grew up with John Gotti Jr. too. No, right? no, no. Oh. I didn't grow up with him. We became friends later on in life and- uh, Your paths crossed. Our paths crossed through MMA. His son's an MMA fighter. He just fought Floyd Mayweather a few weeks ago. Yep. And uh, guy's a gentleman. Uh, I mean, he's a was a high, high level guy. You know, you know, allegedly he ran the- 
family when his father was in prison, but uh, he did his jail time. Uh, he beat five trials in three years, like millions and millions and millions of dollars in legal bills. And uh, he got out, you know, he just said, listen, uh, you know, you got six kids. He's like, you know, I got to bring these kids up and, uh, and he's doing good. He still lives in New York. You know, he's around all the time, but he's done with the, you know, he's doing all positive things. Now he's done with the illegal, uh, illegal aspect of things. But uh, real gentleman, I mean, really a good father, got a lot of good things coming. He just made a documentary. It's coming out called Witsec Mafia. It's been a few years. He actually let a couple of my friends have acting roles in the movie, you know, I mean, in the documentary. And, uh, and uh, he kind of helped us get into the acting business, which I was never an actor. I mean, you know, never, but I never ever thought about it. But uh, he hooked us up with some people and, uh, and that's another, so we can go on to that after. But yeah, so I'm, I'm doing that kind of thing now. I was in a couple movies already. One will be coming out hopefully this year. It's, pre, it's, it's all production is done and stuff. It's with uh, great actor, James Matteo. He played in Band of Brothers, uh, uh, Hook, when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. Some top, uh, the, the, the offer uh, on, uh, you know, based on the, the making the movie The Godfather. And uh, he was uh, shooting a, a, the Willie Pep story, who was a pro boxer. It's called The Featherweight. Leonardo DiCaprio's a, uh, production house company that product, produced everything. And uh, we, were, we went there, me and a, a dear friend of mine who did 18 years in federal prison for extortion, he was in prison in Raybrook with John Jr. And uh, we got together uh, with another MMA fighter named Damian Trites, who was a friend of mine. And he said, show up to Hartford, Connecticut. We're filming the movie. Maybe we'll use you in the audience. The camera will pan. You'll be in the audience cheering or whatever. And so we go there during COVID. And uh, it was very stringent rules. You know, you had to uh, take a test or they wouldn't let you in. So our friend Damian ends up popping positive for COVID. They said, you got to leave. So it's only me and Brian. So we're there. We meet the director, James Maddow. The star comes up. He plays Willie Pep, looks just like him. And he says, uh, he looks at us, you know, and he says, uh, oh, no, we're going to use you differently. We're not going to be passing you. You're going to have a role. I'm like, a role? I'm not even, you know, I did one thing before, but I'm not an actor. So I ends up from going for somebody they're supposed to pass in the audience. We're in a talking role with the with the star of the movie in a locker room scene. And of all things, I play a bookmaker in the gym where Willie Pep used to train. <laughs> and I'm smoking a cigar. It's, we've got the old clothes on. They had to take makeup, cover all the tattoos. You're supposed to be like in the 1950s or early 60s. And uh, we get like two months later, we get a message, me and my friend Brian Hoyle, and said, hey, congratulations. You're in the movie, in the actual scene, talking to me. Because, you know, he did a talking thing. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, are you kidding me? And I said, well, thank you for the opportunity. And he goes, thank you for bringing uh, authenticity to the film. <laughs> and I'm in like a, you know, I'm a big guy. I got the cigar. I got the 1958 suit on or whatever. And what an experience. I mean, it just, and from that, other things are starting to come positive. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. I mean, I'm, I'm older now. I got grandchildren. My two daughters are, God bless, married with great husbands. So now I'm just trying to do the right thing and do positive and, Unfortunately, you know, I got tied up with something three, four years ago, but that's another thing, just wrong place, wrong time, but you know how that works. But uh, it's all about, you know, you don't have to wait, in my opinion, from what I'm seeing, you don't have to wait till you're facing 40 or 50 years or 30 years in prison. You know, while the money's good, everybody wants to be a gangster, but then when they're facing 25 years, I mean, come on, the cooperators today in the United States or <laughs> East Coast alone, I mean, it, it, they but just, you didn't have this mindset back when you were at the no, peak. You were no, you like the money. Gone the, home. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you, girls cost me a marriage. You know, I had a great wife, my two beautiful daughters. But there's only so much a woman's gonna take when you know you're coming home and you got groceries and the FBI is waiting in front of your house yeah. or the state police organized crime task force comes in and completely destroys the house. You know, they take me. I'm going in their little cruiser. And then I get out a day later when I make bail. My wife, the house is upside down. I mean, a normal girl, she was a hairdresser. I mean, you know, people, oh, some girls, that's cool. No, it ain't cool. Not when you have two little kids. So at the peak of this, when you're really at the peak of being this bookie, are yeah. you thinking about ramifications like, hey, I'm associated with these guys, no. that, that, that law enforcement no. could be looking at me? I knew they were looking at us. They used to follow us. They used to send, after like a couple of the cases, they used to send pictures to my lawyer and say, 
uh, I'd be coming out of a Italian pastry shop and then a couple of my friends that were involved uh, would be behind me and I wasn't supposed to be with that person. So they would write to my lawyer and say, listen, you know, but they couldn't prove we were in there. Well, I went in there to get, say, pastries for my whatever. Yeah, ladies, yeah, for my grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they couldn't, we were never like in front talking, but so they're, they're on you. They're on you. So you it's know? like the movies are sitting in the crown, Vic. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. And they write up a report, special agent, whatever his name was, followed me through boom, bang, wherever they, they, listen, when they're on to you, they're on to you. So some of like the perks of being in the mob, was it, what were they? Like, what were the benefits? Are there a lot of girls, uh, the money, the gambling? I mean, yeah. I mean, like I said, uh, you know, I mean, everything. I mean, I mean, it was a very, uh, you were living good. Oh, living great. We were vacations. We were, I'd take my wife to Florida all the time with the kids, you know, later on, uh, the restaurants, uh, you know, wherever you go, you don't wait on line. Honestly, we used to have a chi a big venue. Uh, uh, it was a um, Asian, I mean, not Asian, a Polynesian restaurant called the Hukilau. It's famous on the East Coast. Uh, great guy, Johnny E owned it, his family and uh, sons. And there'd be lines. They'd have all these top comedians or top performers. And remember the scene, and, and this is God's honest truth, and anybody that hears this from my ear will know, but it was like that scene from uh, Goodfellas when they walk through the kitchen and around and there's tipping people and they walk up and the guy puts a table, if you ever seen the movie, right yeah, in front of, of the stage. God is my judge, that was us. I'm sure that was a lot of people, whatever thing you're in, if you're in a gang or biker, you know, you're spending money, boom, it just is like that. And uh, it was like that, as God is my judge, uh, you know, I'd go in there with my girl and my wife, whatever it was at the time. And honestly, the line's out the door and they're like, Chicky, come on. They open a side door and my friends too would do it. Go right in. And it was just, a, you know, did I mean, you, it comes with a cost, but you know. Yeah. Did you ever good. feel bad about going into some of these restaurants knowing that they had to give up some of their hard earned money to the mob or anything like that? I never, I got to be honest with you. I never seen that in our area for a long time. They didn't really bother um, straight laced working people like they didn't go up to them like you see in the movies a little bakery with a mom and pop i'm going to come for 150 a week every i don't know about new york because i you know like i said i wasn't there but i'm sure they do that but not in my area they didn't not till later later on you know and that's basically that kind of uh attitude doing that took down organized crime in my area just for doing that because a lot of these people that did own restaurants and stuff would be kind of secret uh they would call even guys who are on the street earning, they would own strip joints in my area, big money places. And later on in life, a couple of my friends would go in there and they would say, hey, listen, we got the dumpsters, whatever they used to say. And, you know, and they were no sooner walking out of the door, the guy was on the phone with Organized Crime Task Force. So, I mean, yeah, all the years of my young years, I never heard of that as far as going in extorting legitimate people. But then when they started doing it in the late 90s and early 2000s, that brought so much heat, you couldn't even imagine. It was crazy, you know? Did you consider yourself a mobster? At no, that point? I mean, no. I mean, they say associate, whatever you want to call it, but. What did you view yourself at as that time period? Do you think you're just a like hustler, a normal? Like a, a hustler. hustler. I didn't hustle drugs or nothing like that. I was never, because you got to understand, since kids, we were told, you know, I don't care if you hustle, I don't care if you Shylark, which you loan money and you get so much back every get point, you know, $1,000. Give me $40 a week until you paid a thousand off. So we did that kind of stuff, but never the drugs. I mean, I never personally did the drug business, but it was going on. You know, everybody did, did that. But uh, we were told since kids, you know, listen, you can be around us, hustle, blah, blah, blah. If you got a score, but with drugs, I was always told, especially by Bruno, you know, listen, you know, you do that, you know, it, you'll go right in a dumpster or you'll be in the trunk somewhere because they don't want that. It brings heat to them. And I know some do care. They don't care where it's coming from. Just give me on the side of money. But uh, in my particular case, they used to they used to tell us. A lot of the guys used to say, "Listen, don't get around that stuff. Don't don't get us in a you know. Don't put heat on us, or you're gonna have a big problem." And so I never really was into that drug business. You know, now, I, I, what were your principles as like a bookie? Did you have certain principles? Like if, if if I came to you, if you're if I'm like a young kid coming to you trying to place a bet, or, do you have rules? Well, yeah, you know. As we know, nowadays it's different because the government is really kind of organized crime now because especially Massachusetts, one of the last states to um, put 
sports gambling legal. You know, we were like one of the, you know, Connecticut got it, then we got it later on. But um, so it's different now, you know what I mean? Uh, but uh, no, you know, the bottom line is we know who was who. If a guy made 400 a week working, you can't let him bet a thousand dollar game. So the only rules I had was a lot of my friends were degenerate gamblers. So if I knew the kid was only making, you know, back then four or 500 a week, I'm not gonna let him bet two games for a thousand a game. You know what I mean? They lose 2,200, they make 400, you know, uh, you know. So I kind of, kind of watched it with like, you know, I know who was who. If a guy owned a pizza shop, he was making 30000 a week. He wants to bet four games for 1000 a game. I salute, do it, you know? But So that's the only thing I really had, you know? And I used to watch, like, uh, they had tricks, like the pass post, and, like, they tried to call you at five after one. Oh, I couldn't get through. And, and meanwhile, I had the little, we had little beepers at the time. They used to tell us the scores. And it's cool. the team ran an 80-yard, you know, they were already on top seven points, you know? So they a lot of people tried to do that, uh, but... And what's you know. the process, like, from when someone gives you the money to you paying it up to your boss? How does that work? Well, that, that see, I never, I just did the office. They have a guy that, in my case, they had a guy that went and paid and collected. You know, I just did the office, and I, every, and I would fax just like I had to clean out other people. They would clean me out. So it wasn't like they trusted me. Oh, yeah, just see me at four because, you know. But um, now it's completely different. It's a great way. Well, they used to have a great way, but uh, we used to have to fax the stuff to another office. And then at the, every night when the games were over, you would call the other guy and you would go over, you'd have to have the same figures because at the end of the week, the clean out guy would give somebody the figures and I would give my figures and they better match, Yeah, you know? So uh, yeah, they had a good system, you know? And we used to do call forwarding where if they track the number, they might think I'm at, just make up a street, 32 Boston Street. Meanwhile, I'm already three fast forwards. I'm, in, I'm somewhere, in another city, you know, because you could just fast forward, what a call forward. Yeah. So we did that, but once they're on to you and they start following you, you ain't got a shot. So this is why they call it organized crime. Yeah, right? yeah. What do you think was the biggest misconception about the mob and, and organized crime at that point from the public standpoint? I just placed an order for the Chef's Choice Factor meals and I am so excited for them to come in. I am someone who is always on the go between the gym, working on the podcast, and other day-to-day -day tasks. So it's important for me to have healthy and convenient meals delivered straight to my doorstep to take the hassle out of going to the store, picking out ingredients, and then putting a meal together and packaging it up myself. This July, get Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, and enjoy eating well without the hassle. You choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash locked in 50 and use code locked in 50 to get 50% off your order. Guys, I've been super dialed in on my fitness lately, usually working out twice a day, six days a week between weight training and boxing. My workouts would be incomplete without having premium, ready to eat meals featuring high quality ingredients such as broccolini, leeks, and asparagus. By choosing to order my post workout meals through Factor, I could treat myself to 34 plus weekly restaurant quality options like bruschetta shrimp risotto, green goddess chicken, and grilled steakhouse filet mignon ready in just two minutes. Building a business such as this podcast eats up the majority of my time. One of my passions is cooking, but with my hectic schedule, I don't always find the time. With Factor, I'm able to skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the shopping prepping and cleaning up too while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality I need. Factors fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all I have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back into doing what I love. Head to factormeals.com slash locked in 50 and use code locked in 50 to get 50% off. That's code locked in 50 at factormeals.com slash locked in 50 to get 50% off. I'm so excited for you guys to start eating Factor meals along with me on my journey. You know what it is? People that were around that, like not even organized crime guys, like families of uh, Italian families that came over from uh, uh, like um, different small areas, Queen of Jays, Italy. There are certain families that a lot of them from Springfield were from them. Bragiano. They were from certain little areas. They would come, their cousins, their brothers, they would all come and open pizza shops and everything. And, uh, you know, 
regular people, Joe, you know, I don't want to say Joe Schmoes, but regular people that didn't know about their life, they were very, oh my God, you know who he, you know, he was walking around with, you know, oh, you see this guy eating with him. I mean, they used to get, oh, don't do nothing. But, it, you know, the people that knew him from, like, the old country, it wasn't yeah. like that, like, not in my area. I mean, don't get me wrong, they got a lot of respect, but it wasn't like we were going around bullying people, and it was nothing like that. They show movies where if you say something out of line, they crack you. I mean, I mean, it did happen, but not like the movies, you know? Were you ever put into any dangerous situations? Oh. What was, like, the most dangerous you were put in? Um, Well, there were some dangerous ones, but I don't know. But... Um, you know, like one time, I'll give you an example. Um, the kid was an up and coming at the time. He ends up becoming a boss. And we used to go to a cigar shop every day and get cigars. And he loved cigars. And we'd go there, have coffee, have a cigar. And the guy, this is just one small example. The guy at the place uh, actually changed my friend's wife's truck tire. She had a flat. So he pulled over and changed the tire, which is great. That's fine. So we didn't know at the time, but for about five, six days after we went in there. Now, if you're married and I'm good friends with you and uh, your wife has a flat on the side of the road, I pull over, I help her change it. When I see you the next time, I'm going to say, hey, Ian, did your wife tell you I changed her tire? What, what, what is it to hide? Well, this kid never told my friend. It was like a secret, you know, and my friend waited like two weeks. He waited and the guy never mentioned it. And the wife had said, oh, so-and-so help me. Now, if you see the guy every day for scars, why wouldn't the guy mention, by the way, I helped your wife. So right away, my friend thought, like, what's he trying to look to do something? Is he looking to maybe, you know, make a play at my wife? And uh, I can remember he called me and another kid and him. And it was like a Sunday afternoon. He goes, meet me over at that place. I go, well, what happened? He just meet me over there. And we went over there. And it was like two weeks. The guy never said nothing. And uh we ended up going over there and uh, he walked in and he told us outside, he said, so I'm going to crack the kid, you know, whatever, whatever. And we ended up cracking the kid. You know, we hit them over the head with computers, gave him a pretty good, and the kid ran out of his own place. And needless to say, the word went on the street, not because of me, but word went on the street from my friend, tell him to sell the joint and just leave town because it ain't going to be good if, you know, if he's, and the kids ends up selling the joint like very shortly after and took off to Boston somewhere. But that's just one thing. There was probably 10 things like that. All because he didn't tell. Right. Like, no. in other words, that's kind of sketchy, wouldn't you? It is, I yeah. Mean, He's but, probably but trying to get that's with That's the him. way we thought then. You know, that's something. Why wouldn't you say that? I know it's simple to a normal person. They're like, well, big deal. But uh, Now, is anyone messing with you or are you protected? Like, no, I'm not. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. It was not like, oh, I'm protected. You know, I, I didn't have to worry about being protected. We grew up with tough kids our whole life. So, I mean, there was cases we got in trouble where, different, you know, guys, real guys like Bruno would say, leave this kid alone. You know, his father's my friend. But if the kid abused us or said something disrespectful, we didn't listen to Bruno. In other words, Bruno would say, hey, this kid told his father you're looking for him. Not to me, to generally all of us. And we'd say, yeah, we're not going to do nothing. As soon as we seen the kid, he got cracked his head open, whatever, you know. So we got in trouble a lot of times for that. We got in trouble. And uh, I mean, Funny stories. I mean, we thought they were funny, but one time uh, we went, I didn't, but five of my friends went in uh, to a bar one of the wise guys owned, and there was a heavy kid driving a big Cadillac, and I'm a heavy kid, and I got a Cadillac. So uh, it wasn't me, though. You know, that night, it just happened to be another heavy kid with a Cadillac. Allegedly? Or? <laughs> well, it's been more than five years. I don't care. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so we got in trouble. You know, they said, oh... Uh, these guys were there. They beat up the bouncer and the threw him, broke glasses. And the heavy, the fat kid was driving the Cadillac. So right away, that's chicky. Right away in their head, and uh, which it wasn't. I would tell you, what's a big deal? And uh, they called for us. They wanted to have a. They call it a sit down, but they wanted to sit with us. They had enough. We fought too many times in their bars. They were going to crack us good. We were going to get a good one. Probably four of us. We were going to get it good. And uh, we never showed up. We said we're not going. We know it was going to happen. So we pack up my caddy. Now it's really me. We put our bags in the car. We go to Fort Lauderdale. You know, I guess they call it going on the lamb, but we took off because we're not going to get, we're, at this time we're in our tw mid twenties, whatever. You know, we're not going to go there and get a beaten, you know? Yeah. And they, 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 you come in. It's actually funny looking back. The, you know, they're your buddies. Hey, come on in. And they get you in and they shut the door and they're like, you know, then they start, you know, like you want to come out, bang, bang. They start cracking you. So we said, nah, we, we know it's coming. So we took off to Florida for about a month. 
me and my two friends and uh they called finally word got to us no come back they, it's bullshit they're done they're not gonna they're gonna do nothing and uh so with dummies we came back and we ended up getting cracked <laughs> <laughs> well i was lucky I, I got out of it somehow but i was there but they ended up cracking uh my friends and then when they came to me there was another serious guy in my area his name was anthony delevo serious guy he knew me he was good friends with my uncle and he goes ah leave this chicky alone you know and i'm laughing under my breath and one guy's got a nose broke the other guy's got a big eye with blood another guy needs stitches and i'm sitting there perfectly normal and now we're on our way home after that meeting after the meeting and we're laughing we're joking one guy's holding his eye one guy's holding his nose and they laugh, this is our thinking, and they go, listen, look at Chicky, he ain't got a mark on him. Let's pull behind this building, give him a beat, and so he looks like he got it too. And we all laughed, but that was our mindset, it was crazy. Yeah. What do you think is like the craziest story you've had from being a bookie? Like absolute top out of everything, out of all those years as a bookie, what's the craziest? Well, what I see personally, which was a smart move, uh, the friend that came with me today, Anthony Grasso, who someday you should do him, he, he's got stories you wanna believe, he ended up, you know, he was known in our area, great kid, heart of gold, but he was known to be a degenerate gambler. That's just the way it was. And uh, I mean, if there was eight bookmakers in our area, he probably owed seven of them. I think he owed like $100,000 at one time between all the guys. And uh, he ends up taking up to go to Vegas. He borrowed $1,000 from somebody, ends up going to Vegas. I mean, you could do a documentary on this kid. And uh, left his wife, his kids, he just went. He had to get out of town, you know, because they were looking for him. And he ends up going to Vegas, and on a thousand dollars, as God is my judge, he gets down to like two hundred fifty dollars, two hundred dollars left. In one month's time, he turns two hundred fifty dollars into four hundred thousand. He wired money to every guy he owed. If you and he didn't even have to give extra, but if he owed you twenty thousand, he gave you twenty four thousand, just as like, hey, I'm sorry, but boom, boom. And he ends up coming back, and after he paid everything, he had like three hundred thousand left over. And and it, it was a crazy story because that's something like you just don't even. Yeah. If he would have lost that two hundred dollars left, he's dead. <laughs> he said no. He well, he wouldn't have came back. He said I would have been a waiter at MGM or wherever, whatever casinos out there. You know, he said I would have been a parking attendant. You know, how's he gonna? You know, whatever. But that was crazy. And, what uh, game did he play? Oh, he's a sports guy. He's a big sports guy. He'll tell you a story. He went to a boxing match. He bet forty thousand on the boxing match, and uh, it was some fight. I don't know. I'm not a big boxing guy, but. You know the guy got booed out of the ring, and he, he he ended up he ended up winning, but a lot of people lost, and they were throwing stuff at the guy. It was crazy, but he's got stories that's so funny. He was sitting around having dinner and sitting around with Lionel Richie, you know, because when you're, when you're betting that kind of money, you're in the top location, especially you know, back then. Yeah, 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 that's nuts. But he was funny. All right, so how does this all end? Like, how do you get wrapped up in a federal indictment? Did you know it was coming? I know we talked about the news article, but yeah. I want to hear about like the day they raid you and, and, and everything like that. Okay. And if you expected it. All right. It was, it was a uh, late 2004. How old are you too? Um, I don't know. I want to say maybe 20, it was, uh, I don't know, maybe 27, something like that. No, no, no. I'm sorry. My early thirties, 32, 33. Okay. And uh, never forget it. I went out in the morning to get coffee. Did, well, what happened was about two weeks prior, I was at a member Blockbuster, the video place. I was returning my, my kids' movies. They had some Disney movies. And I'm walking back to my car and I hear somebody go, hey, Chicky, they talk to you like they know you. Didn't even know who these guys were. I go, he goes, hey, Chicky. I turn around and I go, what's up? I didn't know the guy. He goes, how you doing? He gives me the card. I'm a uh, so-and-so FBI. I go, yeah, what's up? He goes, listen, you got big problems coming, you and your friends. I go, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'm just letting you know you got big problems. You know, if you want to talk, I said, I got nothing to say. I don't even know what you're talking about. So at least to say, I took the card and I get in the car. And I, of course, I go somewhere right away to show somebody. I said, here, they just said we got big problems. Ah, you know, they no one can. Oh, I don't listen to them. They're just trying to, you know, bust. I said, yeah, no problem. So like three weeks later, I go out in the morning, 630 to get coffee in the paper. And I stop around my father's house. And my mother and father at the time uh, would live a mile from me. And it's like seven in the morning and uh my phone rings, it's my wife. And I know it's seven in the morning, something's wrong. So she's like, where are you? And I go, why, what's up? She goes, there's about 20 federal agents here. They got the road blocked, you know, all the cars. So it was funny, I'm having a call from my father. So I said, can you drive me home? He goes, you got your own car. But I didn't want him to bring my car because then they search it. Not that I had anything, but why put myself through it? So he goes, why, what's wrong? I go, 
the, the local police are there. I'm making them feel good. The local police are there. They want to give me a warrant for parking tickets. Oh, yeah, no problem. Come on, get in. So, of course, I leave my money there. Every, I get everything done because I know I ain't going home. So uh, I leave my car. I give my mother the keys. So I'm coming down the street, and it, you had to see it. it. was Look, I'm laughing now, but my poor father, right? And he's straight arrow, right? And I pull up, and there's like, they're on the lawn. The doors, all four doors are open. You know, they make it like it's in a movie. And uh, his face, he goes, oh, yeah, local cop serving uh, for Parkinson's. What the hell's going on? I said, just drop me off. No, I'm going to wait. I want to know what's going on. I go, please, Dad, don't embarrass me. Just drop me off. I'm good. And they took me into custody, and uh, we went to the – they bring you right to the federal building. And uh, I had got uh, – four of us picked up a case. One guy was the boss, Bruno, which he was murdered like – Six months before that, in our in the club parking lot where we the Italian club parking lot, he was shot five times. They killed him, and um, so he was an unindicted co-defendant. He would have been on the case, and then the underboss at the time was my co-defendant, and the other guy was a good guy too. But he was just a normal guy that just got caught up, and uh, yeah. So that was the, that was the big the first FBI pinch. But it was just straight. My thing was straight sports booking with conspiracy. And then uh, no violence, no violence at all. And, you know, there's no violence, really. I'm surprised they put you on with the big names, though. Uh, they they kind of roped because it's a conspiracy. Yeah, it's though, a right? conspiracy. Did yeah. you get bond or are you locked up? No, no. You wait a day or whatever, and you get the in federal. You don't got to come up with the cash. I guess it's yep. a, bo a bond. Yeah, you someone signed. Yeah, the house and that's and... that's what I told you the story where I came out of the federal snowing. It was a snowy day. I'm in a bright green <laughs> Celtic sweats, but I'm a big guy, so I stood yeah. out like a sore thumb and. I got the prescription. These are prescription, but I got dark. I have an eye problem. Yeah. But uh, so I'm not trying to be like a big shot. <laughs> but anyways, I used to have the glasses like that too. But that was the front picture I was telling you about. Fat, chicky, rounded up, all this stuff they said. Remember I told you that story. So uh, yeah, we got bonded out and, uh, you know, I ended up pleading guilty. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a big, like anything without violence, you're not going to do a lot of time. Is the mob like sitting down with you though and saying, hey, if you snitch, this is what happens? No, I mean, or... we, listen, they didn't have to say that. We knew. It's unspoken. Yeah, right it's now. unspoken. We don't, nobody has to say that. Plus you've been hanging around with these people five, six, seven years old. We already took pinches for saw and battery, dangerous weapon, a baseball bat. Another friend of mine got hit in the head with an ax, not because of us, just fighting. Yeah. So it was already unspoken since we were six years old. I mean, at the time, uh, you know, one of the times, uh, well, actually, you know, it happened with Sammy Gravano, Sammy the Bull Gravano, mm -hmm. ratted on John Gotti. So it was already in our head, and we used to talk to each other that low. You know, you say, you know, the way it is, you know, all this, well, I can't believe it. You know, that yeah, was our people, mindset. People talk like that until shit hits the fans. 100%. So what's your view on snitching? Listen, I would, never, I would never do it. I would never personally do it. But then again, I'm not going to put myself in a position where I got to go face in 30 years. Cause I know I'd go do the, I have to go do the 30 years. So that's my message is, uh, you don't have to wait when the money's, when the money's good, everybody, Oh, boom, boom. They want to do it. But, and they'll do, they'll, they'll walk it right up. I mean, say what you want. I know they say John Gotti senior was flashy. He was. And, but I'll say one thing, he walked it right to the end. He knew who he was. He smiled at the press. He, he laughed. He knew who he was. And he knew at the end, you either got to die or you go to prison for life. And that that's how it works. And he walked it right to the end. People could say he was flashy. Yeah. They could say whatever they want about the guy. You know, you're not supposed to be on Time Magazine to cover. But the guy lived it and walked it. Uh, he, he walked it right the way he lived. Right to the end, strapped to a bed in Springfield, Missouri, a hospital, cancer, throat cancer. I mean, uh, there was a story that I heard actually from one of his sons that he told me that for last rites, the priest came in and said to... The brother sitting there, the younger brother, we want to give your father last rites. And 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 then the nurse was with the with the priest, and the nurse said, We want to give him some more pain medication. Or he wasn't taking pain medication. They said, We want to give him pain medication. And he waved off the cop. Like, I mean, I'm sorry, the cop, the priest. He waved him off. And the nurse said to his son, This guy is in agonizing pain. Tell him this medication can help him. And he waved her off. And then he winked at his son, and when his, he like told his son to come closer, and he said, no pain medication, truth serum. So even at his worst, when he had literally days to live, he's telling him, no, he don't want pain medication because he was afraid it was, you know, it could screw his head up. You got to respect that. Yeah. 
listen, they could say what they want about him, but he walked it to the end and it is what it is. And there's guys in there. I mean, I was with a guy in MCC Manhattan. I was only there a couple months, but I met a guy, Vinny Basciano, and I brought his name up before. Woke up every day, did his workout. You look at the internet, his pictures all over the internet. Now I think he's in, uh, in, uh, in Florida in a federal prison. Tan, got two life sentences. He took it, took it, you know, there's guys out there that they, 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 they say that, they do that oath. And they 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 go right to the they go right to their death with it. They knew what they were signing up for. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. Listen, you know you can hear like Sammy the Bull, John Gotti was going to turn on me. I mean I know there's the tapes, but John Gotti wasn't telling Sammy. If you really think John Gotti was telling Sammy the Bull, listen, the the streets need the boss. You're going to take the weight, and I'm going to go to. If you really believe that conversation took, you know, for true, come on, a guy his whole life wasn't like that. He was telling, but. Everybody has a everybody has a, a excuse, you know. Just say the truth. I mean, you know, I got hit with a life sentence, and I'm I, I couldn't. I'm not doing it. And I think people would respect that more than all these excuses. Well, this guy turned on me. This guy, whatever the reason is, I but don't see, know. like that's why you have like you have all these people you see on social media nowadays. When the rappers or celebrities get caught up, they're like, oh, if I was in their position, I'd do the same thing and tell. But these these people knew what they were getting into. Right. That's, you you that's sign up for that shit. That's a point like I'm the thing it. with my whole business partner and stuff. Mm -hmm. He was involved with me. Like you knew what you were doing. You have plenty of outs. Like if you 100%. suspected something was wrong. That's when you get out. You don't Walk do away. it. When, yeah, not when the feds are at your door right. and you're trying to cut a deal and throwing a, a, your best buddy under. You know, you don't do and that. That's, well, that's the message I'm saying. And I'm not, you know, advocating, advocating anything. All I'm saying is when the money's good and you're living the life and you're getting a side table in front of a concert, whatever you're doing, yeah. come on. It comes a point where you're like, listen, I got kids now or whatever the reason. I got a nice wife or whatever. And I don't want to go do 20 years, 30 years. So I'm done. You know, you, you just, in a good way, you wash your hands, say thank you, and you can even be honest. Thank you so much. I'm good. And you know, that could all be obtained legally. You yeah. don't have to get into crime to be rich. No. Yeah. Well, nowadays, it's incredible the money you can make legitimately. Anywhere. You yeah. can do anything. I mean, it ain't, back then, it was yeah. a hustle. Back in the day, the people came from Italy, the police, you know, they, they didn't want to be policed by, so they had their own little, but them days are over. I, I mean, mean, I think it's just because also there wasn't social media where people could see other people be successful. Now I pull up Instagram and there's 9 million oh, sex come on, successful come on. entrepreneurs. Yeah, come on. So you just got to study it. You got to figure yeah, out what you want yeah. and, and you'll find something. Yeah. How much time do you end up getting? Oh, for the book Mason case, yeah. uh, they, I think they wanted to give me 16 months. I mean, it was nothing. 16 months, I think I did a, a, a year and a day. So you got but a year no, and a day. Yeah, but no violence you get into the violence that's where you're going to get hit yeah and then there was different cases where you you know small amounts you know, assault and battery as a kid this that the other and then unfortunately uh december 5th 2019 you know i happen to have a house uh you know yeah well we'll get to that yeah, yeah well, i'm just saying so, that's yeah it was good till then and then i just happened to you know so all right so checky you got this year and a day prison sentence mm -hmm. in federal prison your first federal bid Something I'm curious about is yeah. what's it like to be someone that was known to be an associate of the mob in federal prison? Because like when I did federal prison, we all knew the Italian guys had it good. So yeah. what's your experience like? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, when you come in there, uh, they kind of know, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. They'll feel you out. But uh, it's, wherever I went, like, uh, like I said, MCC Manhattan or... U.S. Penitentiary Canaan in Waymar, Pennsylvania. They were, uh, you know, took me about maybe a half a day to find out what's going on, and they'd come over to you. The Italian guys would come over and be like, you know, they, they'd see your number. There was a couple numbers in federal prison, like you know. The three numbers, it shows what state you're from, and then they have another number uh, that means organized crime. They used to, I don't know about now, like I think it was 087. I don't know what the number was, but right away they know you know, either your own people will come to you, like people from Massachusetts and federal prison, as anybody that been in federal prison knows, that the boss, they call it a Boston car, or the New England car. They're serious guys. You know, you got a lot of the Irish guys from uh, Charlestown, South Boston. I mean, anywhere in Boston, but, you know, and then you got the Springfield guys, you got Providence guys. So the New England guys kind of stick together, no matter what they are, whether it's bank robbers, Whatever they are, you know, Charlestown's big for, for armored car heist and bank robbery. So they come right up to you and they, they'll say, uh, you know, oh, I heard you're from Springfield. Yeah. 
Then they'll direct you. They'll be like, hey, did you go see so-and-so? He's over there. He wants to see you. It's another Italian guy from New York that I was in with some pretty guy, great guys. And uh, then they'll come up to you and, hey, what's up? Where, you know, where are you from, Springfield? And they know. You know, they're not stupid. They know. The Italian guys know what's what. And they're like, yeah, do you know this guy over there? And I'll mention it. Meanwhile, what they're doing is they're just kind of playing you because now they can get word to New York to somebody and say, hey, uh, you ever hear of this kid, Chicky? He's with Bruno. Just say, I'm giving a thing. And they'll make a couple calls. And within a week, they're like, hey, yeah, we heard about you laughing. And we heard you're a funny bastard, whatever it is. And uh, so it was, for me, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it was very smooth. You know what I mean? Uh, you were taken care of. Oh, yeah. I mean, not that I needed to be taken care of, you know, because I was, I go in, I'm a gentleman. I do my little thing. And uh, just concentrate on working out. Believe it or not, I lost a lot of weight. I, I came out like a, a movie star. That's how everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. I came out incredible. And needless to say, six months later, I'm burp, right back again. You know, because you're enjoying life. Yeah. If anyone but, uh, wants a good laugh, they could Google Ian Bick and see the, yeah. the images of oh, me. Really? How I used really? to look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Now, do they give you like a care package when? You oh yeah, yeah. In? As soon as I came in, and I got a couple of funny stories. But as soon as I came in, you know, before they even check you out, they knew the name, and a couple of Italian guys came with two bags and they're like hey shower shoot just to get you going because you know as you know when you go in you really don't get commissary for the first week or two by the time everything transpires and uh oh hey and of course i say yeah no you got it no we don't need it i said listen then yeah you know and then i made a care package and gave it to them for the next guy who came in yeah. that they liked or whoever hey give them the bag to help them soap to whatever you need so that was that was easy that was nothing and then uh it's crazy to say, and you'll know I'm, I'm telling the truth. Anybody in federal prison, I'll tell you, or any prison, you can make some really great relationships. I mean, uh, you know, I made friends to this day, guys, I mean, good guys. And lifelong friends. Yeah. Lifelong friends. And I'm now one guy's in Hartford right near me. We go, the kids spend time, well, they did spend time together. And, uh, and uh, you know, my, my, my Sally, great guy from Connecticut, uh, very successful now. And, and you can meet some good people. You really can. I mean, there, and then there's people like on the street. You'll tolerate them because they're in there with you. Maybe they the cell next to you or whatever. But as soon as you leave there, you don't even look. You're like, well, I'll see you later. You know. Well, you know what it is when you suffer with people at rock bottom. That that forms a connection. Hundred percent. And and only certain people can understand that because you have to be in that position. Hundred percent. And that like it, it's an automatic bond. Right. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. And then like the wives would become friends, and if they're from New England, they pick each other up and stay overnight in a hotel for Saturday because it was only Saturday and Sunday visits. You know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the wife would then by the, by the time, like I said, compared to like my friend Brian did 18 years. So, I mean, that's a whole nother thing. But, now, uh, did they have to check paperwork or no, because you're mob they wouldn't related? Let, I, they wouldn't, they, they, I mean, I could have had my lawyer send it in, but I guess now I never had a problem with that because they make a call or I don't know how they did it back then, but they know within, within four days, they knew exactly who I was or oh, you're there. Oh, that guy, that guy, they knew everything. I'm like, wow. But if it came where I needed it, I would have had my lawyer somehow get me the paperwork, no problem. But now, today, it's easy. They Google you, they'll find out anything. You know, nowadays, it's easy. Now, you, know? you went to a penitentiary. Yeah, I was only, I was a penitentiary. They had me, well, I started off, I needed uh, medication when I went to, because uh, I got an illness through the military. I caught a, a, a neurological illness. And they couldn't treat me. So when I went, I, I was a self-report, organized crime, I mean, uh, sorry, Sports book and no violence, self surrender. Yeah. So I surrendered to the penitentiary, USP. They had me there for one whole night. And then they asked you what medication you're on, which I had sent them, they sent you, and they didn't have it. And I needed it because it makes my muscles weak. So next thing you know, I'm in a sheriff's van driving at like one in the morning from um, USP Canaan, Waymar, Pennsylvania, three hours away. They bring me to New York City, uh, Metropolitan uh, MCC, Manhattan. Yeah. And they had me there two months, you know, to, uh, you know. Transit, so, yeah. So really my first federal thing, I started off in, and that's where I met some notorious great guys. I'm, I'm really uh, laughing with the guys. Like I told you, Vinny Basciano, great guy, took me under his wing. And uh, I was only there about two months. And then they put me back. They brought me back. On a, I went through the, with the bus, the big bus. And you pull up in New Jersey at the airport. And I didn't fly, but they had all the people loading the, the big jet to fly all yep, over the country. Con Air, yeah. Yeah, and they, and they took me to a van with like eight other guys to USP Canaan. And uh, so I end up back in Canaan. I'm, I'm in the penitentiary for probably about three, four months. 
And then, because of no violence, which I sh probably should have just started there, but about three months, then they brought me to the camp, which is right on the same property. Which is where you should have been the first time. Yeah, I mean, come on. But it didn't matter. I got along with everybody. But the camp's more laid back. I mean, you know, you're still in prison, but it's more like uh, you're not cells. It's a, a barracks kind of thing. And But, but you know, you're just with guys that either, some of the guys there were either uh, all white collar or, or a lot of bookmakers, or it was notorious guys, uh, not murderers, but like big cases uh, of uh, where... They did already 28 years. They had two more years left. They brought them down to the camp because nobody's screwing up after doing 28 years. You ain't going to ruin it, you know? Yeah, and there's no politics. No, no, it's no, good. no. And now, it, going back to the, the paperwork aspect for one yep, second, yeah. what would have happened if they found out you were a rat or a snitch or right. you were no good? Right. I mean, what they do is they shun you. I mean, obviously, you know that. It ain't, well, I don't know. First of all, I don't think... Uh, was uh, cooperators get their own unit. Like they, they got a cooperation unit. Like on MCC Manhattan, they had a floor for just cooperators. Okay. And then they have other floors. Like I was with everybody in 11 South, but there was a floor where they had, from what I understand, they told me guys are in, there were telling me, Oh, this guy testified against me and I got 25, 30 years. And that little, you know, whatever the little bastard is on the second floor, whatever floor it was the cooperators, you know, and they come in and like, Sammy the Bull was there, you know, when he was doing test because he didn't just testify on John Gotti. I think he testified on like 56 other guys. And he had a mark on his back. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they got in trouble. A lot of people got in trouble for that because they went to Arizona, I guess, looking for him from what, I, from what social media says. But um, yeah, so I mean, now, now, nowadays, let's be honest, you know, if you're a cooperator, no big deal. You get out, start a YouTube channel and, <laughs> you know. No, and if, you know what's crazy to me? Maybe it's just me, but you had mentioned it before. You look at the comments, and there might be one comment, you know, you bastard, rat, whatever. But the other ones are, I love what you're doing. I love your work. Oh, my God, whatever, who it may be. You know, you've changed. And unfortunately, a lot of these guys didn't change. They really didn't. There are guys that changed and said, listen, I'm done. I mean, you know what's a sad state of affairs when a boss, a legitimate boss, Joe Mazzino, flips. He's a boss, you know, of one of the five families, and, and he flips. So, I mean, when stuff like that starts happening, I mean, like I said, I'm not saying, oh, give me 100 years, I'm a gangster. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is... The principles of change. I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm facing 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. I, you know, it was getting to a point where it might have went to the next level. Yeah. And, you know, and I said, listen, you know, like I said, I root for the bank robber to get away, but <laughs> it comes a point where you got to look at the mirror and say, come on, you know, is this crazy? I mean, you know. How are the Italians eating in prison? Oh, good, good. It was good. But like I said, once you get in there, me, my personal case, I was eating healthy. I was out on all the tunas, all the chickens in the packets, wicked healthy. So I lost a lot of weight. And, uh, I used to laugh and say, I wish I could go do six months now and take off 60 pounds. But, you know, we laugh, but, uh, you know, but um, no, they always ate good. I mean, you know, they would cook. I'm telling you, it's ama still amazing to me. They should, somebody, you know, I don't know if they've done it. Somebody in a prison system should write a cookbook on how to cook in prison with the microwave because the things they used to do, it was unbelievable. I said, I, I, I couldn't even cook in a stove like that. And, you know, the, the Chinamen, would, or Chinese people, excuse me, would cook the things and it was crazy and then italians uh uh clams with the macaroni i mean I, we weren't eating like the i know they have them but the roman noodles and all that we weren't eating like that you know spaghetti then you would always have a connection in the kitchen i used to send the kitchen the head of the kitchen guy in his commissary i have my wife send him 100 bucks a month whatever it was to give me like the turkey i remember uh thanksgiving i was in thanksgiving and I paid the guy. I, I, it might have been four books of stamps, just say whatever they were, seven eighty-five at the time per book. He brought me a whole turkey, real whole turkey, wrapped up in tinfoil, cooked, and I put it on the table with me and like six, seven guys. We had it. We ate the whole turkey. Beautiful, whole turkey. People are looking. Of course, you know, you see a guy looking. Come on, have some, whatever. You know, uh, my birthday in October. My friend from Hartford, my, my at the time, my Sally brings. Big cake. It looks like it was made at a professional pastry shop. They cooked it in the kitchen. And we would get the eggs. Like a lot of guys would, protein guys would eat, drink eggs and eat eggs. We'd get eggs. We'd get all the fetch, uh, vegetables, 
tomatoes, all simple things, you know, that you can't get. You, you know you know how it is. You can't get it. Yeah, I used to always see the Italian guys not go in the chow hall because they would have yeah, someone on payroll to make it. In a year, a little less than a year, I bet you I went in the cafeteria, whatever, the little place where we ate. We, we didn't have to eat in the unit. We had a cafeteria. Yeah. I probably went there, I was honest to God, maybe three times in a year. Because you were getting taken. No, care. I'm talking breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I didn't go. Yeah. Like in the morning, I'd have my tuna afternoon. <laughs> you know, I had a routine. Yeah. And then at night, we'd, uh, you know, we'd play cards. I wasn't a good card player, but they'd play cards and bust chops. And we'd have our, you know, we'd get some diet ginger ale or put out pretzels and whatever. They we made it like it was fun, like you were out. Now, you were a natural born hustler. Did you hustle in prison at all? Did you become the bookie? Did you do No, anything? no. There was guys that did that, but I just didn't want the aggravation. Stay you know, yeah. Line, I mean, you know, I would hustle good, the good food from the kitchen. Like I said, I, I was really doing good then. So, and I, I always looked out, like I said, when you brought up the bully thing, if a guy, you know, if I met a guy, not even a tiny guy, it could be anything. Uh, I remember I met a guy from Maine, real country bumpkin kind of guy, never had money, the poor guy. He used to eat with us. And I'd say, listen, uh, you know, my wife will throw a hundred bucks in your account here and there. You know, help the guy out. I mean, you, you know, like I said, you can't eat in front of somebody and they're, you know, you know they ain't got nothing. You were a solid guy. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I don't know about, yeah, you know, yeah. No, I For was, but I, I, yeah, I look, yeah. And then I played sports, believe it or not. I played, uh, it was funny. I played on the touch football. It was touch, but he might as well say it was tackle, the way they play, you know how they play. And I remember a guy used to say, yell, used to scream across the field, maybe like 6'5", 280, African-American guy, and he used to scream, I played for Penn State. I, you know, he got, and I'd say, I don't know, and I used to bust him, and I'd say, I don't know about Penn State, but I know you played for the state, Penn. Like, I'd bust him. And uh, he leveled me one time, like, I was the hiker, and I would hike it. A quick story, and he hit me, like, I go, buddy, we're not in the NFL, NFL over here, relax. And they would have all the, the gangsters from New York, like the older guys. One guy was like 85 years old, great guy. And he would, see, he, and we'd be yelling, he'd yell at him, you hit Chicky like that again, we'll put you in a trunk, you know. Laughing though, we did laugh, laugh around, and uh, but so I played the sport and uh, I played the football. I wasn't great, but it was and something to do. Everyone's calling you Chicky in prison. One hundred percent. Yeah. Now, what is the craziest thing you've seen in prison during your one year? Well, fights, a lot of fights. You know, give kick, me the best one. I want to hear the best one. Well, was no. I know some of your uh, people on your show, guest, yeah. they got crazy ones, stabs and guy yeah. head cut off. And everyone's, I, everyone's story's different, right? But yeah. I didn't see that. Okay. But I know one thing. In, when I was behind the wall for, like I said, not long, but when I was behind the wall, they were killing, they used to call it gladiator school, uh, Canaan, USB Canaan, you could look it up. They were killing guards and everything. It was no joke, but but I didn't see it, but I'm just saying that's what it was known for. And uh, yeah, mostly fights, uh, like attempted, it wasn't, didn't happen, so what is it, attempted stabbing, guy would pull out a shank and go like this, and they'd rustle him down, that'd be the end of it, but. Do you think if you weren't Italian, you would have had a much different experience? If you weren't associated with the crime families, that it would have been different for you? I don't know if it would have been different, but I mean, I'm my own self. Like in other words, uh, you know, whatever. My name is Joe Smith. I still carry myself, not a, like a tough guy. I'm not saying that, but I got a good personality. And I, I and yeah, you know, I know that I know even before I went just from small things, uh, I knew the politics small politics, don't get involved with the gambling and the drugs, which I never was anyways, but, you know, whatever. And I knew that uh, one funny story I'll never forget. It probably did help me out that I was with the Italian guys, but on the commissary, they had a religious, a religious where you could buy religious uh, rosaries, and they had carpets. Uh, now For the Muslims, right? I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> so I figured, let me get a couple carpets, and, you know, you put it by your bunk, and at night you take off your shoes, and you get a little feel in a home. So I'll never forget it. Uh, I buy two carpets, one for the front entrance and one for my, for, I was on the bottom bunk. And uh, this head guy who was the Muslim guy, head guy, and he wore the thing, the head thing. So now it might have went a different way if I wasn't with the certain guys I was with, but he knocks very calmly. So Mr. Just Mr. Chicky, they used to call Mr. Chicky, this guy. Yeah, what's up? Uh, whatever his name was. He goes, can I speak with you? I go, yeah, absolutely. I go out and talk to him. Now it could have went a whole different way, I think, if maybe, I, was, I don't know. And he says, you know, the, carpets. I said, yeah, ain't it nice? I put my feet, relax. And he goes, that's our religion. We pray on them. Didn't even th I didn't even think about it. I really didn't. And I'm like, oh my God. I go, I apologize. It was only like, I Thomas here was Friday, maybe it was Friday afternoon, right after I bought them. So I rolled them up and I put a rubber band. I said, 
Is it insulting? Can I give it to you to give one of your Muslim people that maybe can't afford it? And oh my God, thank you. I said, no, I apologize. But I didn't even think of that. But it's small little, I mean, in some prisons, I probably could have got you killed. I don't know. I mean, that's like the same thing when you go into a Muslim man's cell, like in the shoe or anything, you have to sit to pee or kneel to pee. There's yeah, all these yeah. etiquettes that you don't even think about on the outside People don't world. think about it. Yeah, yeah, like even going to the bathroom, the other one. You say, you know, you don't do it. You try not to do it at night when you're both sleeping, when you're locked in. Yeah. You know, during the day, I kind of had a little schedule where when he went to work, because I worked in the unit. So I was around, you know, I could walk during the day. I could really do a lot of things. And they would have to go, because, you know, you got to work in prison. They would work, say, up at the, wherever they made this or that. They would go out in a bus to work inside the prison fence, I mean, yard, wall. Absolutely. And uh, so I would use that time, and he would use maybe at, you know, whenever, when I was doing my thing, he knew my schedule. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just saying where, so you, you get, well, you know, I knew pretty good politics, but this was a better, you know, you learn more. Now you get out of prison. Are you going back to work for the mob? How does that work? No, it was when I got out, uh, you know, obviously probation, you got to really watch yourself. But then, you know, a couple years after I, I was still hustling around a little with sports with them kind of with them, but without them. Like, in other words, they really didn't know what me, like my friends and me were doing things that could have got us in a lot of trouble. But at that time, it was a real weak point for them because uh, the boss got murdered and the other bosses were old that were in prison. So we kind of did what we wanted in the city. Who's going to say anything? You know what I mean? So we were loaning money out, you know, Shylark and the people, you know, stuff like that, you, small amounts. You didn't want to go work like a regular job or no, anything? No, no. Yeah, well, and keep in mind, for that. when I was getting in trouble too, I was retired. So I'm, I was getting a hell of a from, monthly from the military. military. You got that even while you're in prison? Yeah. Wow. Well, the social, now, if you get Social Security, that stops in prison. But when you get a medical discharge, it's medical, they keep going. So you're good. Yeah. The social, I had a small Social Security, but that stopped in prison. But then as soon as you get out of prison... You go down to the social security department, oh, I'm out, boom, they, it goes back on. Now, are you allowed to just leave the mob on your own terms or? It, well, like, I was never, I never took an oath. I never, I mean, I was basically, you know, it was, like I said, it was different in our area because I was around these guys my whole life. So it wasn't a matter of going to somebody, can I please do, you know, whatever, whatever. You didn't have to do that. You know, now I know if you're that next level or whatever you want to call it, it's harder. You know, you can't just, uh, you know, it's hard to just to walk away, but you can be a lot smarter, but I was never at that that big level, you so know. You lived a pretty quiet life and stuff, and just in retirement, I guess. Afterwards, yeah, after yeah, prison. yeah. You know, like yeah. I mean, I was around. You know, I did things. Did not crazy. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't crazy, but I did a lot of things. You know, and uh, and like I said, and then uh, but things were you, going good. Do you think it was different because you didn't really feel like guilty about anything? You didn't hurt anyone. You no, weren't like no. It wasn't I like wasn't you out to extorting repent. people. Yeah. I wasn't doing that. Or out like if taking advantage, beating up a guy for no reason. I, I never was like you that. You were who you were. And it's not like in some scenarios that we talk about on the podcast where someone does like something outrageous, right. goes to prison, has to change themselves. Like no. you were your person, you were doing your thing. That's it. You took your time right. and, and that was it. And, but, don't, and don't get me, excuse me, don't get me wrong. Uh, if somebody disrespected me on the street, it was going to be handled. Not a tough guy, nothing like that. Yeah. But in other words, I was a, I was always known to be funny and bust smiles and laugh, good time. But you know, there was a couple instances, not, not crazy, but you know, if somebody maybe is a little disrespectful in a bad way or something, you're like, hey, buddy, you know, I'm not a tough guy, but don't push it, you know. Yeah. And there was times like that. No one ever abused me, you know. I mean, uh, you know, not like that. Not not because I'm, I'm a tough guy. Nothing to do with that. Yeah. Just. I was who I was, and I, I didn't do that to anybody anyways. I would never go disrespect somebody. I would never disrespect a guy's wife, girlfriend, sister. We were brought up around, you know, with our, our friend's sisters, and we were taught from a young age, you know, I don't care who you are. You don't disrespect my mother, my sister, my girl, my ex-girl. You just don't do that. But and, not everyone has that mindset, you know? Isn't that crazy, like, the different backgrounds man, and how you're raised and stuff? Like, yeah. the average man, or I mean, some men are just not going to sit here and say what you're saying now and then have those principles and stuff. I mean, and, I guess I'm not just, saying I'm better yeah. or worse than anybody, but I'm just saying that's how I was raised uh, old school. Do you think yes. it's because you've experienced a lot too? Like you've seen a lot in your yeah, life. You've been I around mean, a lot. of Yeah. Shit. And I've seen, don't get me wrong. I've seen friends of mine's, you know, sisters, you know, maybe another friend secretly was dating the sister when he could have just went to the kid and said, Hey, listen, 
you know, in a good way, I really like your sister. Would you mind if I took her out? It's a five minute conversation. Why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Why would you feel like you got to sneak around or like a man's ex girl or ex wife was totally off limits. I don't care if she looked like a movie star and you know, whatever. <laughs> I just, we, uh, me personally and a couple people around me now were like that, but you know, in every batch of apples, there's always one that don't yeah. care. And they you just, can't date someone's ex girl. Exactly. Yeah. Or ex wife, especially. And that's the word I hear. Yeah. You see these stories where like, the, the the husband passes away or something and uh, then the the wife's date and the brother oh forget it forget it is that like what happened with the bidens or something oh like, come it's, on it's, it's crazy, crazy man. it's great it's just like i said we live in a world today that's just i always say to people and they laugh and i said it's like we live in alice in wonderland you know the clock sings all stuff that shouldn't be happening is happening you're like are you kidding me you know you walk through a little door and it's like we're in Bizarro World, uh, now, in my opinion. On that note of Bizarro World, you got wrapped up in another indictment. Yeah, are you the biggest like, one in East Coast history? Yeah, well, what happens? Like, you were my luck. You weren't even a part of it. Like, uh, you were. You got bad timing. Yeah. Like, what happens? A family member, a nephew of mine, a forty-year-old Italian kid. Um, they were serving FBI. It was all over the news. It's called Operation Thrown Down. It's the, the dismantling of the, uh, allegedly the Latin king and queen nation. And uh, according to the FBI, allegedly they had my, my nephew at the time uh, was one of the heads from Boston to Miami. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I'll get into when they came, but at the end of the day, it was, a, it was a pretty much a shit case. They made it out like it was El Chapo. And when everything came out in court, it was a shit case. I think the... One guy got seven years, and they had everybody who was going to go do 20 years. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, it is what it is. It wasn't a big case like they thought. So, uh, yeah, December 5th, 2019, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, me and my nephew had a place together, you know, a big place, a colonial, beautiful section of Springfield called Forest Park. And uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, I'm watching the news, just happened to be up watching the news. My nephew sound asleep in his room, and I hear the, Bang, 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 loud. And you know the only one it can be is the cops. It ain't going to be no guy trying to rob you, cause they ain't, and it ain't going to be somebody knocking your door, somebody, you know, whatever. And uh, I yelled my nephew's name, and uh, he said, what? And they, and they only did it maybe seven seconds. Bah, 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 bah. And then they threw the flash bombs through the window, the whole downstairs. And then, like, when them go off, I mean, I went from watching TV in my boxers it seemed like an hour later, it was like four minutes later, we're head to head with zip ties, you know? They were coming to serve a uh, federal, they, they arrested that day, 65 members, 500, over 500 law enforcement, federal, or, uh, state and local. Um, helico they had the, the helicopter four in the morning with the light on the house, two huge dog teams, whatever the dog teams. And it was a huge, you know, it was back 2019. And it was like a, Alleged, they say it's, it was the biggest takedown in uh, history of East Coast. Uh, and you weren't a part of it. You were just you were nothing to there. do with them <laughs> other than having the same blood in, are, in are my you, in are, my right. Are you like like mentally sick at this point? You're well, like, no, they here told we go me, again. <laughs> they told me they uh, no 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 because I knew I wasn't part of it. Yeah. And they told me, listen, we're not coming for you. We we'll just let us get your, your nephew out of here, and you can. You know, we had two pit bulls and they're, they're, they got the red lights with the lasers and the smoke everywhere. I'm like, don't kill the dogs. They don't, they don't even bite and they don't bark. And uh, so they put the dogs away and uh, they, within 20 minutes, and then Effie was out of there and they said, here's the federal search warrant. We got to do a search. So I said, do what you got to do, right? And I'm hoping, you know, my bedroom was the last room they searched. So I'm sitting there like two hours and they were telling me, the feds were like, hey, we followed you. So there was a, a gentleman's club in my area called the Mardi Gras. And we used to go there a lot. And uh, the feds are telling me, hey, Chicky, we followed you in the white caddy. You were uh, coming out of the strip joint with a girl, whatever. And I'm like, why were you following me? What are, I got nothing to do with nothing. Oh, but by, you know, whatever, we had to follow you, whatever. And they're telling me where I went for a restaurant for like months, they were following me. Mm -hmm. And they had nothing on me. And uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, so... My room's the last room, and then I thought about it. I go, boy, I'm in trouble now. You know, I uh, I didn't know the law or nothing, but I, I had a, a Smith and Wesson, Smith and Wesson's in Springfield. I had a legal, not legal to me, 
but it wasn't like a gun used, no bodies, nothing like that. Allegedly. Just was alleged. <laughs> well, no. I, it was checked out. <laughs> Believe me, they checked it. But uh, they found a gun, a loaded revolver uh, behind, on my nightstand. I mean, when you're around that life, especially, you know, with my, my nephew at the time, you know, nobody was coming in the house, you know, there was going to be a fight as far as, you know, I had, I had something, I ain't going to lie to you. And they found it. They found it. And, uh, I was a convicted felon. I shouldn't have had it, but I didn't know my, my, thank God my lawyer had looked, knew about it, but he's like, if this gun, if it comes back clean, just a gun, but I know you're not supposed to, I couldn't do it because of my previous sports bookmaking conviction. Yeah. So I guess federal law, I mean, you can talk to any lawyer, the gun was from Springfield, Mass, Smith & Wesson. So they couldn't prove the gun left state lines. So they charged you with ammunition. Okay. Ah. Right. But so, you know, if anybody lives in a state where they got a gun factory, carry that kind of gun, if it's a federal case. Now, if s the city police or state, whatever, state or city police would have came, it could have been a, I would have ended up doing probably four or five years, you know, for that. But because it was a federal case, Federal law says, and at the time I'm saying, well, I gotta, I'm looking to go do four or five. That's what I'm thinking, because they had me locked up in Norfolk County Jail. They took me. That was a whole other thing. And uh, from what I'm understanding, they wanted to do a documentary on that whole operation thrown down, uh, supposedly. But I, you know, whatever. But because um, it was so unique, the case. But uh, yeah, so they ended up arresting me, and they they took us. I was on the bus with all the alleged Latin King guys, which I knew since they were kids because I'm older than my nephew and he used to have them over the house all the time. They were his friends. Not that they were doing gang things, but these guys grew up. My mother used to cook pasta for them and, you know, Spanish guys, good guys, a lot of good guys. Unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, they, you know, just got in trouble. But so they ended up putting me in Norfolk and I made $30,000 bond, you know, because they know he has nothing to do with it. But so I got on a $30,000 bond and, uh, and, and I ended up, they, they took back my bond in, right before COVID in, in uh, Jan January, end of January 2000, 2020, I'm sorry. And uh, they put me, they locked me up at Wyatt. Uh, yeah, Wyatt the Wyatt, Tension Center, uh, yeah, Rhode Island. Pro right, pro yeah. yeah. So I was there for almost three months. And uh, my lawyer said, well, we're going to go to the judge and we're going to re-get you back out on your bond. Because they, they said there was no reason they had me there. There was no reason I didn't do nothing. They couldn't tie me to anything. So, But what happened was COVID had just hit and the courts closed. So something I should have been there a couple of weeks until they reissued the bond. I was there three months. Yeah. So, but the three months at the end when I pleaded guilty, it came off. You know, at the end of the day, I, I got an illness uh, from the military. So my lawyer did a great job in Boston in front of the judge. They wanted to give me like year and a half for the ammunition, convicted felony ammunition. And um, my lawyer gave the argument. Well, at the time, Massachusetts wasn't uh, legal to gamble. So he says, Your Honor, you know where this is going. Pretty soon we're going to be legal. So basically, you're, it's the kid didn't do anything wrong, but she said, "Well, we're not there, Mr. Hagen. My lawyer's Dan Hagen. We're not there, Mr. Hagen." So he gave the argument that if I go to prison, it would have been a federal prison. Maybe they would have kept me at Wyatt. I pleaded guilty, and they said, uh, "My lawyer argued, you know, this, that. They want to give a year and a half. I had three or four with the time of the being. I had about four months, three and a half months credit, and uh, he explained that he did some research where my illness." Could, I could, if I get COVID in prison with my health conditions, it could hurt me. So I'll make a long story short, uh, they end up giving me house arrest, uh, you know, instead of the jail time. So if I would have ended up with a year, they just put me house arrest where I couldn't leave the house and monitor bracelet. You're on that. the ankle monitor yeah, and everything yeah. like that. Yeah. And I swear uh, my friend that's here with us today, Anthony, was in the court. So right away, my lawyer says, we're going to, I think we're going to get this house arrest. And, and as God is my judge, and I said, Get me the year. Because now in my head, I'm thinking, I'll go do a year, lose a ton of weight, and I'll come out looking great. You want to eat all that Italian Because I, well, I didn't know <laughs> that you know, I thought it was going to be torture. They're going to look to violate me every... So I said, let me go do the year. And, and you know, this is what I'm thinking. And my lawyer says, listen, anytime you walk out of federal prison without jail, yeah. it's a win. And, you know, of course he was right. I wasn't thinking right. And uh, so I ended up doing... I just got off it last... Uh, this... this uh, April. I Has just, that like made you think about things even more like thinking like yeah, who you hang out with, who you associate 100%. with? Uh, listen, there's a saying all over the internet, a lot of these shows that do uh, successful say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Yeah. And and now I know that more than I went from having a hundred people, 
friends, or maybe I got five now, but. You only need a few good friends. That's it. You yeah. could take, like that guy says, that funny guy. Joey there. Diaz. Yeah. Yeah. You those give me three bad viral. mother effers and you could take over our country. <laughs> but, you know, it's just. You remind me of him a little bit. No, geez. I wish I had his, uh, I could be comedy like and make the money. Now, what's your message to like the kids and even the young adults or even grown adults that find it fascinating, uh, like mob life, crime life, and you've lived this. You you grew up in that position to a certain extent. Yeah, to a certain extent, allegedly. Yeah. Um, but you, I like that. you grew up like idolizing these people. What's, Absolutely. What's your message to them now that you know everything you've been through, everything you've seen? Listen, first of all, don't go watch movies and think that's the life because you're not seeing the part where they bust your door down and your wife is crying and you don't see your kids and all that. Which, thank God, by no means am I being Mr. Hard Guy. Gee, I didn't do a lot of time. I really didn't. But I knew enough where well, I was lucky too. But when you get into the violence, when you got bodies and, a, and, a, and a, the conspiracies, you're going to get hit hard. So really my message is uh, it ain't what you think it is. And, and I'm blessed enough, to be honest with you, Ian, that I didn't have to face a 25-year prison or you know whatever, whatever the sentence would be. I didn't have to go through that. But I also knew I could be, in, I could be doing things right now. I'm off everything. But uh, at the end of the day, it ain't worth it. I mean, at my age, it ain't worth it. Maybe these kids are 20, but even the gangbangers, I'll tell you, I was in the gang unit at Wyatt and I had all the guys around me, the, the allegedly Latin King kids. And I, I knew them since they were young teenagers. So they're really, they, you know, and like I said, that's another thing in Wyatt, they told me I had the Italians there from Boston too. So I had two tables to sit at. Yeah. The Latin King said, you sit with us and eat. Mm -hmm. The Italians would say, you sit with us and eat. So I'd chop it up. I go for breakfast and lunch with them and Italians at night. And they, they was weird because they were looking at me like, how, why do these guys... Like when I came in, not to go off the subject, I was like, when I came into Wyatt, they opened that big, the door slides open and I'm going in there and I got my bed and all, you know, all this stuff. And all of a sudden I hear, Chucky! and the big Latin kid, kid, allegedly Latin kid, this kid Apache, gentleman, tough kid, <laughs> comes walking over and all this man, these kids start hugging me. And the Italians are like, what the fuck is, what's going on here? Because they didn't know the background. And then uh, anyways, make a long story short, I got along with, they had me there. You're a likable guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, not everybody will agree with that, but I hope to, I hope to people come off like that. What are your like three biggest life lessons that y you want to instill in your kids, into the world, and, and to in general? Like people listening to this, watching this right now, what's, yeah. what are the three takeaways? Change is possible. Hundred percent. Change is possible. Um, you know. Uh, what you think, as far as certain lifestyles, what you think is really happening, what's really happening, uh, the, the, the deceit, the 16 face bullshit back and forth, they don't see that part of it. They watch Casino when everybody's eating and girls are in the car. They don't see the part where, uh, like I said, thank God I never was in this predicament, but it's your best friend that walks you into a, door, a room and you don't come out. So it's it just, uh, just be careful. Like in other words, change is possible. Don't don't believe everything you see on TV where you think it's wonderful because you're not seeing the bad part of it. You know, maybe it's some movies, but not really. And just just be in it. And I'm not gonna lie to you. I mean, I had a lot of years where I was not a good person. You know, I did things not crazy like violent things, but I did things. Uh, you know, robbing this, that, the other thing, money from. Listen, it's just that change is possible, and uh, just try to be a good person. You know what I mean? Uh, you know. You don't have to go crazy, but just be nice. Be, be nice to your fellow mankind. Uh, I mean, two seconds, open the door for people. I mean, once you start hanging around with positive people and people that are doing the right thing, it's like a whole nother world. And don't get me wrong, I got still close friends that, and I'm, you know, allegedly they're still in the life. And they see me, we go, you know, like I said, I, I used to, you know, whatever, parties and hugs and laugh about the old times. And, and the most important thing is for me personally, my daughters can walk anywhere they want in the city with my grandkids and, and, and they're respected. It's not like, oh, your father's a scumbag, oh, your father's a cooperator, whatever. And that happens a lot, you know, with people when, when they do that. But so to make a long story short, it's just that be positive, be nice to people. Think, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a product of myself because I did a lot of crazy things. And I'm looking back, I'm like, oh, my God, I was so embarrassed. How could I do that? So as time goes on, I'm 55 it, it, it took a long time to start thinking this way, but uh, since I've been thinking differently, it's a whole nother world. Things have opened up, you know, other than me want, trying to lose weight, it's hard, but that's my biggest worry now, you know? Yeah. And I'm at the beach a lot and I'm by my pool. 
So I, I, I'm blessed. I, I, I'm blessed. Like I said, I'm I'm very blessed. And uh, are you, you know, more conscious now 100%. than ever of being a good person, hundred percent, giving back, hundred percent, hundred percent. Even and another thing is a very important message: small things matter. If you're married or you got a, a girlfriend, don't take it for granted. I mean, I took it for granted all through my 20s and 30s. And at the end of the day, I got I'm blessed with great daughters and everything. But you know. It, it wears you, and at the end of the day, you know, if, if you're if you're not conscious of what you have when you have it, when you lose it, you're gonna wake up realize. You know what I'm saying? You know what I like about you, Chicky, is that I get a ton of emails and DMs daily from people that want to come on the show, and yeah. they're, and they're giving me the highlights of like what they did and the craziness yeah, and this yeah. and that. And you, you know, you reach out to me, or I reach out to you, yeah, and yeah. you reach out to me. And the mm -hmm. first thing you said was, "Listen, Ian, like I have all these crazy stories, this and that." But I want this to be, I want the message yeah. to go out of why this is important. 100%. I think a lot of people don't get that. And that's also why we're so different as a podcast and a show, because we're, it's got to have that inspirational, motivational factor. It's not like what you search on YouTube no. where it's all violent, the crime. You could go on any YouTube channel and talk about that. You got guys out there doing yeah. podcasts. Uh, oh, I killed three people two days <laughs> later. I killed 10. The same guy. Yeah. Did you kill three or 10? You don't yeah. know eight, seven, eight more bodies. I mean, and, and, and it's all about, I've changed. But I shot a guy, split his head with a bat. Have you changed? Talk about change. Yeah. I mean, I could tell you, if we had two more hours, I could tell you a hundred stories. But, but <laughs> it's not about that. It's about don't wait until it's too late to change. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, every day I'm trying to improve better and better. And people could look at your story and it's back to the what if thing. Like if I'm listening to your story, I'm like, well, what if he decided to take it to a new level? His life could have been over. So it is important to think about those in some aspects. Right. Absolutely. And like I said, I'm not going to get into this story. It's a big story. But when they killed our mentor, which was Adolfo Big Al Bruno, and people can Google it out of Western Mass, it was huge. It was huge. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the kid who was part of it, you know, was kids with us, with, with him. And, uh, you know, he wanted to be, well, he, whatever, whatever the reason I can't answer for him. But, you know, at the time, if he, if, if Bruno was out of the picture, he's the big honcho now. So for whatever reason, it's none of my business. But when that guy got killed, our guy after a Sunday night card game, you know, it was like, it ain't been the same since. And anybody tells you differently is lying to you. Not in our area. Yeah. And, uh, it was just a shame. It didn't have to happen. And, you know, like I said, we're here now and he's not. So, I mean, he's got a great family. I good, very good friends with his sons, but it's just, it's a terrible, at the end of the day, you're either going to end up dead or in jail doing life or like the government hopes you do, you cooperate. Now, last question for you. Yeah. How did you get that scar? Car accident. Car accident. Yeah, you car accident. Know, there's no crazy story no, behind it. I, no, well. <laughs> you didn't how, get shanked. How I lived, how I lived. <laughs> Uh, I mean, how I lived through the car accident. Uh, that'll be that's for a part crazy. Two. Yeah, that'll be part two. <laughs> Chicky, but, thank uh, you yeah. for coming on the show today, man. Thank you for having it's been me. An I appreciate it. Pleasure. I appreciate having you. You're a gentleman. Thank you. You got a great production team, and uh, it was an honor to come up here. And where could people find you? Do you have social media? I got. So, I got. So, uh, well, you know, like I said, I'm going to be starting a YouTube channel. I can't really. I don't know the name of it. I was thinking about. I don't want to say the name. Somebody will download it and keep it. But uh, I'm on. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram under Chicky, two underscores. You know the little oh, two. Chickatelli, my last name. Well, I had it. They somebody took the one Most underscore. Most people they use what? Yeah. So. Well, they somebody <laughs> took my name under that one. But I'm the the real one is Chicky, two underscores, and my last name. You you put it in your description and Facebook. And you know I have fun. I put up crazy things, whatever's in my mind. So when you go on there, after about halfway through, you'll be like, oh, this kid's nuts. Yeah, we'll but put you at the bottom things. of of the episode and, and whatnot. I so. appreciate that. And like I said, uh, yeah, I got to, and the movie's coming out. That's going to be good. The Featherweight, yeah, probably within the, the next year, it'll be out. And like I said, James Matteo, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, AP and Way, his production company produced everything and uh, yeah. other great actors in it. So Chicky that's Chicky the movie star, man. Well, I don't know about movie star, but- uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, the next I big gambling <laughs> movie, I'm going to see you instead of John Goodman. Yeah, I don't know about that. But like I said, I, I take it as it comes. And like I said, I know we're on time thing, but once you start being around positive people and you start changing your life, it just gets better and better and better. And, and I'm a testament to that. So uh, that's about it.